Good evening. I am Mayor Jen Wallison and welcome to the Menlo Park City Council's March 28th regular City Council meeting. This is a hybrid meeting with City Council, City staff, and members of the public participating in City Council chambers. Please note that we may limit public comment speaker time depending on the number of speakers on any given item. At this time, I would like to introduce City Council members and staff present. Vice Mayor Cecilia Taylor. Vice Mayor Cecilia Taylor is participating remotely under Assembly Bill 2449, Just Cause. Vice Mayor Cecilia Taylor, can you please provide a general description of the circumstances related to the use of AB 2449, Just Cause? Thank you, Mayor Willison. I'm using Just Cause because I'm caring for a family member. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. Other city council members present in the chambers tonight, we have council member Drew Combs, council member Maria Dorr, and council member Betsy Nash. Staff present tonight includes city manager Justin Murphy, city attorney Neera Doherty, and city clerk Judy Heron. City clerk Heron, would you please provide instructions to the city council and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison, and again, echoing a welcome to our March 28th City Council meeting. For members of the public who wish to provide comment on any of tonight's agenda items, if you are participating in person, we ask that you complete a speaker card at that back table, and you can return it here at the clerk's desk. For those of you participating virtually, after the mayor calls for public comment on that item you wish to speak on, we ask that you engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you can press star nine at that time. I'd also like to announce that we are currently recruiting for all city advisory bodies. Recruitment is open through April 7th. More information can be found at menlopark.gov backslash commissions. And that includes my introductions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, City Clerk Heron, and just um, echoing our City Clerk's um, notification of our advisory body recruitment. We encourage residents um, of all districts who are interested in all kinds of things to get involved in our city. It's really what we all make of it. So please consider joining a commission. We'll begin tonight's meeting with agenda review. Agenda review provides advance notice to members of the public and city staff of any modifications to the agenda order and any requests from city council members under city council member reports. Uh, staff, as a note, staff will be providing an update to item F5, which is about the advisory body annual attendance report. So at this time, does the city council wish to pull or modify any agenda item? I'm not seeing any um, requests, so we are going to move on to our general public comment, item E. Under public comment, the public may address the city council on any subject not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the city council once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. You are not required to provide your name or city of residence, but it is helpful. The city council cannot act on items not listed on the agenda, and therefore the city council cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment, other than to provide general information. I will be calling for public comment at the appropriate times for members of the public to address the city council on any item under our fixed agenda items sections. Those include presentations and proclamations, consent calendar, regular business and informational items. So City Clerk Judy Heron, can we please now call for general public comment? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment for an item not on tonight's agenda, for those of you participating in person, please feel free to complete a speaker card at the back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. If participating virtually, now's the time to engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine at this time. And our first speaker is Amin Ahmed. Thank you. Um, I live uh, at 427 Bay Road, Menlo Park. Uh, my uh, uh, application to remove uh, a redwood tree in my backyard has been denied. 
on the account that uh, it, ha it, pro it uh, exposes uh, low risk um, by the CD arborist. Um, I wanted to comment on a couple of items. One is the, um, the, the mistake that people use the word risk, uh, and in, also in this context, um, uh, but my background is I'm, I have a PhD in seismic engineering from uh, UC Davis, and I work for a living uh, as a risk modeler. So risk has two components. One is uh, the occurrence of a hazard, the probability of a tree falling. The second one is the exposure. So um, the risk is the convolution of these two components. Um, so what that means is if you have two, two trees, one of them is an eight foot tree, one of them is a behemoth uh, 80, 90 foot tree, if it's assessed that the probability of their failure is similar, it doesn't mean that they have the same, they expose the people to the same risk. One of them is going to create a, a catastrophe if, if, it, if it fails. The other one is going to be a, just a, you know, uh, a discomfort or a, uh, something that people uh, would just do a hand wave and uh, pass by. So um, the, the, the redwood tree in our backyard has no place in that setting. It's a, it's a, uh, it was planted, I suppose, by the first, I was told by the first owners back in 1950s, and now it has grown to be a, a huge, large tree. Over the years, because of the uh, drought in the previous years, the top of the tree, you can see that the, the, the branches have uh, withered and there are, uh, they, they have been affected by the drought. We renovated the house back in 2017. And at that time, you know, we, we had to make some trenches. We had to do foundation. So we, we had, we, at that time, we took some photos of some of the, uh, the roots that had been uh, cut or you know, in order to, to make room for the foundation. Uh, during the past three, four uh, storms, the tree has dropped. Uh, we maintained the tree um, at least twice. Last time, two years ago, we thinned it out. We removed all the dead branches, but still it dropped healthy green branches on our fence, on our uh, roof. That is, so the, the part of the fence was destroyed. We, we re, uh, repaired the fence. But my concern is the tree itself falling on the house. I ask city arborists who's, who's liable. If the tree falls on the house, is the city liable? Is the city responsible for uh, providing the compensation for us? Or if it falls on the, on the neighbor's house, are we liable for any, any damages that ha happens on the neighbors? Sorry. Thank, thank you, um, sir. Unfortunately, we only limit uh, public comment to three minutes, but I think okay. we understand uh, the concern and the point you were making. Uh, oh. We can't comment on it now because it's not on the agenda, but I know staff here is listening. Um, actually, um, City uh, Manager Murphy, um, is there any information you can provide? So, so yes, thank you. So I, I just wanted to say, we, I think we're all, uh, it should be reasonable. We're all educated. We all know that human activity contributed to global warming. We know all that. I'm more than happy to compensate uh, for any changes I make to the carbon footprint. But but we also have to take into account that people want to live in a living, you know, free anxiety. Okay. Thank you, sir. Con Thank you. Thank you. Uh, City Manager Murphy, was there any information you can provide or what's the process for residents? Uh, I believe City Council has been receiving um, some emails as of late in general about people concerned about their trees. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, Mayor, just specifically to this one, this, this individual, Mr. Um, uh, Ahmadi has applied and is going through a process. So that process needs to uh, go through. So it's not subject to, to tonight. So then generally, um, yes, if, if people um, have concerns, they can um, express those to the city. They can uh, apply for tree removals, but he's currently in a process. And so we should not uh, interject in that this evening, but uh, he does have appeal rights. Okay, thank you, City Manager Murphy. And thank you for your comment. Um, City Clerk Heron, next comment, please. 
Thank you, Mayor Willison. So this will be the final call for public comment for items not on tonight's agenda. Seeing no hands or further cards, Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you very much. Um, so we are now going to move on to item E, which is presentations and proclamations. And uh, our um, chair of the Environmental Quality Commission, Tom Cabot, will be um, giving us a presentation on what his commission has been working on. Mr. Cabot, welcome. All right, uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to share with you a little update on the recent activities of the Environmental Quality Commission. We meet monthly and try to produce an environmentally uh, interesting advice, scientifically based advice for the council to move forward in making policy decisions. So uh, we've got a seven member body and uh, we've been meeting to work on things like review of the um, climate action plan. And what we've been seeing is that since council adopted the plan in 2020, 2021, we had the first six goals and staff have been working on those goals, but we haven't been able to add to them since then. So there's kind of a backlog of activities that the council and EQC may want to look into for how to, to get on track with meeting the 90% uh, reduction in emissions by 2030 and 10% sequestration of emissions. So those things are ongoing. Also, uh, we've been working in subcommittees, uh, forming essentially a, a climate outreach subcommittee that has been going into the public and conducting meetings, having collaborative conversations uh, to try to meet one of the council's directions that they had in August of 2021. They ask that, that more public outreach happen before they were ready to make climate policy uh, about uh, building electrification in particular. So we've been doing some background education activities and you can read about those in the packet. We're trying to, to um, follow staff's direction to not be working too much on specific policy matters, but more on general background and providing information about the climate science and also information about ways to move forward and take advantage of incentive programs which have been growing all around us. So there's been uh, in the past year a lot of activity around us where different organizations are putting together the financial incentives to help people move forward and make electrification affordable and more doable. So, so that is going on and you'll, you'll be hearing more about that in the coming months. Um, also, the Federal Inflation Reduction Act went into place, and it provides about a 10-year ramp of different federal incentives, including tax credits available right now, and low-income and middle-income incentives available early next year. So, so lots of those things are happening. Uh, also, we have a subcommittee looking at items related to the trees and the canopy. And they're working with city staff and with the uh, local nonprofit canopy to, to explore grant funding opportunities for making an urban canopy master plan. Uh, let's see other activities. Well, we've been hearing a number of concerns from community members. So we take public comment also in our meetings and then get emails along, along the course of the month. The, there have been rising concerns. Many people are really noticing the climate change coming home to roost. We've had remarkable weather, <laughs> um, just out of the ordinary. Every, it appears everyone's getting somebody else's weather, and it's uh, a bit much to deal with. So, so folks, concerns are raising about what's going on with climate change and about what's going on to work on it. And a number of citizens are coming forward to offer assistance and trying to, to see how, how they can help the city move forward. So we're, we're also trying to incorporate their help into these little subcommittees that the EQC has to work on individual things. Then in the climate science sphere, uh, the, the IPCC, Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has been issuing reports and they are becoming more dire as the, as the evidence mounts. And one of the recent things they mentioned is that 
the existing fleet of fossil fire devices run for just the rest of its regular life is enough to push global warming to a two degree rise, which is the limit that that body has set for uh, beyond there, there's just too much danger. So the existing fleet has that much. And so they're, they're asking that governments work on the programs and processes to quit installing more of those problems. So the EQC has been looking at how to do that and working with staff and uh, essentially trying to, to help council take a look at that as well. But the implications are that, that there's a lot more action needed at the different places action can happen and cities are in a great spot to help that happen at their level regarding buildings and access to electric vehicle charging. So Menlo Park's got a great climate ambitions and a great goal, a goal that would keep us at one and a half if we were able to achieve it, but we, we have been having a hard time getting the programs together to achieve it. So staff is working on that and, and I believe they'll be bringing forward to you a study session where you'll be working on it as well. So lots of opportunities are happening, lots of pressure is mounting in these areas and uh, the, the EQC has uh, its traditional guidelines of its activities uh, on its webpage. There are six items about trees and one item about other things, including climate preservation. But it looks like the uh, EQC is very interested in talking with staff and council about updating those priorities uh, so that the EQC can provide more environmental assistance to the city. So that's a basic recap of some uh, recent events at the EQC, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chair Cabot, for that um, thorough yet brief presentation. Um, I think each slide could probably have its own study session. Um, so we appreciate you providing us the information and, and going over it so we could have a moment to absorb it. Um, at this time, I think what we'll do is hear from public comment. Um, so City Clerk Karen, can you please see if anyone would like to comment on this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on item E1, a presentation on the Environmental Quality Commission's chair report, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. Calling in from a landline or a cell phone, press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to the clerk's desk. This will be the final call for public comment on item E1. And our first speaker will be Virginia Portillo. Hi there, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm wondering if you can go a little bit in depth of the conservation planning that you guys are planning to do in regards to the climate change. Um, are we going to, I know you mentioned that we will be using a consulting company. Um, is there different ones or is there a particular one that you're using? Um, I work closely with uh, uh, um, the stewardship for uh, Sir um in, um in Santa Cruz and they work with a consulting company uh, with Tom Robinson Consulting. So I'm just wondering if we're getting any data um, or information that can help us with the climate change. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And our final speaker will be Katie Baruzzi. Uh, hi, Council. Um, thank you so much, Katie Baruzzi. I serve on the Complete Streets Commission, but speaking for myself, and I really appreciate the work that the EQC have been doing. Um, it's really impressive uh, how hard they're all working. Um, I am curious, I saw a couple of letters uh, to council and I wondered if staff could maybe comment if that would be um, appropriate on this topic about grants that the city could get to expedite solar um, planning. Um, I think one of them was from one of our planning commissioners, but anyway, I just wanted to flag that because it seemed relevant to the topic at hand. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. And I have no further hands raised nor cards. So Mayor Wallison, you may continue. 
Thank you. Um, so thank you, Ms. Portillo and Ms. Baruzzi um, for your comments and um, Mr. Cabot again. Um, City Manager Murphy, do you, um, I think starting with the solar question, um, I believe council received two emails today about an opportunity to get some grant money to expedite solar permitting. I think that's what, the, what it was. Uh, checking in if staff has seen that, thought about that, any information you can provide. Uh, yes, Mayor, I can say that staff has seen it. Staff is uh, researching it and will follow up on the opportunity if it um, is applicable. So uh, people are actively looking into that. Thank you. And then um, Ms. Portillo had a question about, I believe, who we're working with on some of our climate data. Um, if you have any comments about that, I know we have, yeah. Uh, I personally don't, but if she wanted to follow up with us, we can get a little bit more context. Okay, so um, Ms. Portillo, if you're still tuning in, uh, feel free to send an email um, to city council or to city staff um, on maybe more specifics around what, what you were referring to. I think we all agree that we need good workers on, on climate here, um, but I, I think we need a little more clarity um, on, on your comment. So with that, um, I'd like to open it up to my colleagues if there are um, questions, comments, any discussion based on the information Mr. Cabot shared with us. And I also believe just going back to Mr. Cabot's request from the commission, which was, I, I always look at the definition of what the EQC is and see, as Mr. Cabot mentioned, a lot of stuff about trees, which we all know are, are a big topic this few weeks, um, but if it if it's reflecting what our goal is of that commission um, in totality. So with that, um, if any of my colleagues want to kick it off. Um, I have a question um, right here or in this conversation, some of the slides you have talk about uh, electrification as one of the activities that have been done. And I know there have also been questions that have been coming up from the public about uh, the viability of, of gas appliances while there are outages or the, the viability of electric versus gas appliances. And I'm curious if you could provide some, some clarity for us on council to understand um, what's going on there. Thank you. All right, um, thank you for the question. So what happens in modern appliances is almost all modern gas furnaces it, that it, are in our, our uh, larger homes that have central ducting, they will not work during a power outage because they don't have power <clears throat> to run the blowers, to circulate the air or to blow the exhaust out into the neighborhood. And uh, so, so they can't turn on and they can't ignite. So during power outages, uh, it's in about 80, 83 to 85% of our homes don't have a furnace that'll work in a power outage. The, Buildings that have something that'll work during a power outage have the cheap kind of wall furnaces that don't have a fan. They just have a standing pilot light and uh, those would still work in an outage. And then uh, most gas stoves can be lit with a match even during a power outage. But, uh, uh, you know, that that's kind of uh, the extent of it. Oh, and gas tank water heaters. Most gas tank water heaters can work if they're old style in a power outage, but new ones that meet the new construction energy requirements put out by the state, even before our reach code, they required efficiencies that took a blower and an igniter. And so those newer buildings don't have a working water heater during power outages either. So, so water heaters and uh, furnaces tend to be the things that go out in power outages. Uh, thank you. Another question. I know we didn't get to look at the slide, um, but I, I know you, you have also included information here about incentives. And I'm curious if you could just briefly touch uh, base on what those incentives are and what that can mean. Thank you. All right. So, so there are uh, three levels of incentives right now. There are local incentives offered by Peninsula Clean Energy, which is the Joint Powers Agency the city helped form. And those are amounting to 
about $3,000 for a heat pump water heater or $3,500 for a new heat pump. And a heat pump is a two-way air conditioner that can cool you in the summer or heat you in the winter by grabbing heat out of the breeze that blows through your yard. So, so there are roughly $3,000 incentives for each of those. And then another $1,000 from a nine county regional area called Bayren. And so that's about 4,000 for each of those. And then each of those is also eligible for $2,000 tax credits uh, for up to, you know, it's up to $2,000. It's 30% of all remaining costs. So those three layers of incentives are in place now. And then more are coming online provided by the, the uh, federal IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, that will be implemented by the state energy offices. And that will come in 2024 for middle and low income customers. And that's middle income goes up as high as about $207,000. Thank you very much. Other comments, questions from council members? Uh, uh, council member Nash. So I just wanted to um, thank the EQC um, commission the folks there work so hard to um, help our city and our planet um, with climate action and with tree canopies and with um, many other issues, which I think are very important to the quality of life in Menlo Park and elsewhere. Um, I am interested in finding out what it would take to make these changes to the roles and responsibilities of the EQC and whether any of um, other council members have comments on the um, revised uh, roles and responsibilities. I am in support of the changes. Um, City Manager Murphy, can you follow up on how do we go about changing um, that document or the, what have you? Uh, through the mayor, I might be able to assist in responding. Um, this is not an action item. However, the city council can direct staff to return with an action item um, to modify the policy 23-004 related to commissions and committees updating the roles and responsibilities of the EQC, which will then be returned to the council for action. And my understanding is that may be coming um, forward as part of an um, some adjustments that are being made with the finance and audit committee. So that might be an opportune time to do all of that work. Correct. Thank you. Um, Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Willison. And just for clarity, so that item is going to come to the council automatically, or do we need to support council member Nash's recommendation? Yes, as long as there's, you know, a majority um, in favor of directing staff to do so, then we can do that. And I do believe I see a majority. Okay. In virtual and in person. There yes, are um, two thumbs up from council member door and mayor Wallison and council member Nash had already expressed her interest. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that clarity. Um, I I'm, I'm supportive. Um, that is not why I have my hand up. I, I actually had a, um, a couple of questions. Um, regarding the presentation. And I also wanted to thank the EQC for their work um, supporting council policy and also um, supporting staff's recommendation. Um, my question is, um, how are you capturing um, public input? Yeah, so through the community collaborative sessions, uh, we're just taking notes, uh, the subcommittee that, that is doing that, we're kind of operating as individuals, not representing the city during those meetings, but then we gather information and notes and bring it back and share it with the uh, EQC in front of the environmental sustainability manager. Thank you, Mr. Cabot. So I can look at the, the notes, um, the minutes for the EQC to be able to take a glance at that. I'm just curious what um, folks are saying in Menlo Park. Yeah, so we, so we can uh, make sure we can get that into the minutes. Thank you. Uh, uh, before uh, Council Member Combs, did you have any comments or questions? Sure, thank you, uh, Mayor Willison. So I, re I remember, and thank you for the, the presentation. Um, it was uh, 
um, th that was the 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 fastest like sort of how many slides are here like <laughs> twenty two slide presentation. <laughs> like I need to I need to bring you to my job. Um, uh, I remember as as it relates to again some of the issues s surrounding. Um, uh, uh, the changes for natural gas appliances that um, we were going to work to have like a, a sort of a, a sample case or test in in Menlo Park, like that we were going to uh, we were going to be involved in like um, <clears throat> trying to provide residents with actual sort of case studies. Did, did we? Is that something I'm misremembering, or did we make traction on that and I just didn't see it? Uh, through the Electrify Menlo Park uh, program effort that's already started, there are a couple of low-income homes that have been retrofitted with uh, electric heat pumps and I believe heat pump water heaters and maybe some solar installations. So those, some of those are going on uh, it, as part of that program. It, and do we have do we have them as case studies on a website anywhere or that we've documented um and and also I'll, I'll sort of because one of the things I think it's great and, and you talk through the incentives um but it, the incentives as you talk through them don't provide me a clear um sense of what the cost are like right so ten thousand is a great incentive if the cost is ten thousand right? dollars mm -hmm. um but if the cost is something north of $10,000, or if we're looking at the transition for, you know, um, a 1300 square foot house in the willows that's on knob and tube wiring, like, right, like, that's where we get into, like, at least for me, understanding exactly what is going to be the impact to, to residents to, to this transition. And, um, and I, um, in, and, and yeah, I don't, I don't see it yet. M again, maybe that's my own, just not, not seeing it. Uh, but, but I do remember vaguely that that being something that for me was going to be like an, an important to my own education and understanding this impact of like having those, those like very specific case studies throughout the city. Yep. It, and so I, I don't recall exactly what case studies the city would have been doing, but uh, coincidentally, uh, former commissioner Josie Gaylord and myself were contractors to the county of San Mateo doing a study of 10 homes and making the electrification plans. And we have the case studies on 10 homes published. A lot of the results for uh, low-income families are that the, uh, de the device is fully covered by rebates for, say, for water heaters. And, uh, but in almost all cases, the electrification device after incentives was cheaper than replacing it with another gas one. Because when your gas furnace fails, you don't have a free adventure. You're facing six or $7,000 in furnace replacement costs for the gas furnace. And then, then this, other, this other electrification thing may be 20,000 or so, and then brought down to, to, to uh, somewhere around that same cost. Yeah, I, I mean, I understand. Uh, again, I'll just go back. I do think we have to, like, as we have these issues, have like a fully transparent and unbiased discussion mm -hmm. and presentation of them. And, and if not, I, I think that th there becomes a, a, a sort of a, 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 a loss of the city as being sort of unbiased in, in how it uh, and how it approaches this topic. Because again, yeah, if you're talking about a switch out. Um, of uh, an electric appliance versus a gas-powered appliance, um, then if you're looking at it just based on that measure, then then yeah. But if, again, like I was saying, if you're on knob and tube wiring, um, and, and you have to do that update, mm -hmm. and that update is thirty thousand dollars, then then that has to be factored in too. And I can promise you that return is not as quick, right? And and so that's what I I, I say. It's like I I think it's great, but again, we have to make sure that the city. Is presenting in this in a way that that the public can trust that the, that that the city is being fully transparent about all of the ramifications, mm -hmm. and and I'll be frank, I don't know that I see that here, mm -hmm. <laughs> as as we talk about this this specific plan and in this um, <clears throat> specific efforts, and I, I do again think that it's going to be it's going to be necessary um, because there are other residents when we have discussed this. Have been very clear that like the city has not been transparent, right? 
um, and, and has not really understood what the full impacts are uh, to, to, to residents and, and, and the full cost. And so, I, I, again, like I said, I, j I just think the extent to which we're going to um, proceed ahead in this direction, I, I think it's, it's going to be important to, to, to have that. Yeah, thank you. I, I definitely hear what you're saying, and and when it comes time to present uh, case studies, I I understand you're you're wanting to be sure we get a a good apples to apples comparison of what does it cost to yeah. re up with gas and what does it cost to go electric, and and often you know with the issue of knob and tube wiring, we're not using the same wiring when electrifying a house. You're adding two or three new circuits and they're done with new wires to those new devices. So people can keep their knob and tube wiring for their old things that they're still running on them. Okay, um, um, yeah, and, and that's, again, I, I know that there is some um, um, d d debate about, about like that and the impacts and, and um, but, but yeah, I, I think that that's, like I said, that that's that, that that's where I am in, in kind of understanding and, and wanting to, to, to I, I think fully understand the impact and to, but the city and and the EQC out there as as like a, a, a trusted source when it when it comes to um to, to this topic right and and tonight's just update on EQC yeah. activities yeah. was not really trying to be the case studies for electrification policy yeah no totally uh um uh councilman Rudor opened up this questions uh and and we we then had discussions about 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 the cost and, and rebates and what was available. And I, I do think it's, it's important to point out, um, you, you mentioned a couple of times, you, you know, l l low income, but I wanna see like, just because you're not low income does not mean you necessarily have $40,000 to to make all of the changes needed if that's what, what the cost is. Again, I, I don't know. Um, I know what are the costs that I, <laughs> the estimates that, that I, God. Um, but again, maybe I just look like someone who was, you know, someone you give high estimates to. So I won't, I won't share that. But um, I, I, again, like I say, I do think it's, it's important that we're not looking at this from the framing of just a low income perspective. Because again, like I say, that, that then doesn't present the case and the situation of most residents in Menlo Park. Mm -hmm. And so then that goes to, well, why aren't we saying that? Like, right, why are we trying to frame this specifically in the scenario of a low-income situation? Um, Council Member Combs, I appreciate your feedback. And as Mr. Cabot um, reminded us, this is kind of the EQC um, report. We will be having a study session specifically to electrification. And I think that your comments have I mean, I, I'm listening to them. Um, I would imagine Mr. Cabot is and staff is and- But I, uh, I just wanna say like we, I went down this road because it was a, a road that like I said, council member door went down and, and I, I, I thought it was, it was important. I, I think it was very helpful I, to hear your mm -hmm. thoughts. Absolutely. I just wanted to remind the public that um, this item is a EQC commission update and that there will be a future item. It, it, this was in a moose bouche of a large discussion, I think that's going to be taking place about electrification. And I'll just say to my earlier point, it's it's like what what we share and what we don't. And so if we talk about the credits, but we don't then pr provide a full picture of what the cost might be, th then we're framing it in a way that doesn't present us as an unbiased source. Thank you, uh, Council Member Dorn. Yes, uh, turning back to the uh, existing EQC responsibilities and proposed EQC responsibilities, uh, I just want to share my appreciation for the EQC, the thoughtful work and that you've continued to do over the years and that I see reflected in these four new priorities, uh, readjusted priorities to match the, the priorities of what the city is working on with the climate action plan, the needs and opportunities to advance climate adaptation, work on urban canopy and uh, contribute to green and sustainable initiatives. And I'm not sure if we've seen up on screen, um, city clerk uh, page E1.11, which is the proposed new EQC plan, um, but really appreciate this outline and I'm really grateful for the work that you all are doing. Thank you. Uh, Chair Cabot, did you wanna add anything? Uh, well, thank you so much. And just a quick plug for uh, the communities putting together a We Love the Earth Festival, April 22nd, that'll happen at the Menlo Atherton School campus. 
So uh, that'll be another chance for the community to come together and engage in looking at environmental issues and how to make progress on them. Thank you so much, Mr. Cabot. We appreciate you um, and your commission with all this work and for coming here this evening. And we look forward to further conversations on some of the specifics in the future. And um, I believe Ms. Heron has direction also to bring back a modification item on your work plan charge. So um, with that, I think we are going to move on to our consent calendar which is F, under the consent calendar, the city council may take action to approve routine business items in one motion, unless a city council member, city staff member, or a member of the public requests that an item be discussed or continued to a later date. City Clerk Heron, can you please provide the update on item F5? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. I uh, did want to note that on attachment A for item F5, which is receiving and filing advisory body and city council annual attendance report, um, attachment A had the incorrect appointment dates for, at the time, city council members Willison and Taylor. It should be 2020 opposed to 2023. And that's my update. Thank you. I believe that's for Mueller and Taylor. I'm sorry, Mueller and Willison. Mueller and Willison, yes, thank you. Thank you for catching that, City Clerk Karen. Um, so we are now going to call for public comment on the consent calendar. Um, City Clerk Karen. Thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on any of our consent calendar items, F1, City Council meeting minutes, F2, the adoption of an ordinance amending Title 15 related to SB9, F3, a resolution approving the water service priority policy. F4, receiving and filing the investment portfolio for December of 2020, 2022. I think that's right. And then F5, receive and file city council and advisory body attendance reports. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to the clerk's desk. And this will be the final call for public comment on our consent calendar items F1 through F5. Seeing no hands or cards, Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. So is there any council discussion on the consent calendar or does somebody want to make a motion? Council Member Combs? Yeah, I would ask that F2 be removed from the consent calendar um, for, for a, a very brief discussion. So it's to discuss it tonight, not to delay it to another. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not necessarily asking for it to. I, I'm just ooh, not asking for it to be delayed okay. specifically. I, I, I just don't sure. want to. Uh, yeah, it would just be um, <laughs> great if it could be separated from the other consent Perfect. calendar items, which I have no questions about. Perfect. Um, so, are there any other items that folks would want to discuss? Um, should we go ahead and make a motion on items that we are not pulling for discussion? I would make a motion to uh, go ahead and approve F1, F3, F4, and F5. Council Member Taylor. Vice Mayor. I'll second. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Doer and a second by Vice Mayor Taylor to approve the consent calendar with the exception of item F2. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote, city council member Combs? Yes. City council member Doer? Yes. City council member Nash? Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mayor Willison? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, council member Combs? Yeah, so um, I, I wanted the opportunity to um, not vote in favor of F2, which is why I asked that it be removed from the consent calendar. I was supportive of this um, at the last council meeting. Um, after further thought, I became concerned about the parking reduction um, and, and um, had some 
concerns that given that this is not something that has been rolled out fully, we don't completely yet understand the impacts of it. Um, I, I was, uh, uh, my support would be more in line with, uh, as council, excuse me, as staff originally proposed it, which was um, uh, that each unit required at least one, one uh, parking uh, spot or location um, and not, not the 0.5. And so, so in this case, again, if, if the lot results in two duplexes, under the count, uh, the staff's original um, a sketch of this plan, there would be four uh, parking uh, locations that needed to be identified. And under what we changed here, it would be it would only be two. And 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 I I also want to make sure that that reduction right was in connection with any parcel in Menlo Park that that became uh, uh, an SB nine urban lot split parcel and not necessarily parcels that were located in specific so, sort of um, transportation corridors or, or, or things. So, so like a, a, a lot or parcel in suburban park far away from any, uh, you, you know, sort of mass transit corridor would not have, would only have to do like for four units to two parking spots. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Um, so that one parking space per unit would be for specifically for SB9 developments. Um, if a project was not um, being applied for under SB9, the typical um, single family parking standards would apply. So two parking spaces per unit. Yeah, but for, for SB9 as revised by council now, it's only a half a parking space, right? Correct. And, mm -hmm. or, which was different from as you, as staff originally proposed. Correct. And again, my concern, I, I'm all about sort of reducing parking requirements. And I, I think with like large um, multi-unit complexes, again, that makes a lot of sense because there's a certain separating out rental, the rent from the, uh, um, uh, from parking, um, or making it like a, a, a separate um, uh, cost, I, I think is appropriate. But there, and there's a flexibility. Here, you could have essentially for me um, four units develop and only two parking spots, and and, and that means that the, the two units don't have parking spots. Um, and in some neighborhoods of the city, that would be fine. But as I look at it broadly, I, I have concerns about like sort of a scenario where we're creating units um, that don't have parking spots in a suburban context where we also don't allow overnight parking um, and and what the impacts of that will be. And, and I'll just share, and, and again, like I, my family for what, like over 15 years, except for a brief period, has only had one car, right? Um, I only one car down in Los Angeles. I got on the subway and rode the bus and all, and, and it's something I've been very proud of. But I also understand that there is a certain privilege and a certain luck that's connected with me being able to um, orient my life in a way and my wife in a way that we can only, we only have to rely on one car. Um, I work very close. My wife works very close, but in this environment, I was thinking, what if I got laid off and my next job I found wasn't in Menlo Park, right? What if it, it was far away and, and I were in one of these units that doesn't have a parking spot? Like what's What's what? What do I do in that situation? Um, and so this is something that, like, again, concerns me, and and um, and and why ultimately, again, like, I, I would be more in line with with staff's original recommendation here, original plan, which was one unit for one uh, one parking spot for one unit. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Combs. Um, Councilmember Door. Yes, um, I really appreciate Councilmember Combs hearing from you and hearing your concerns about uh, your, yeah concerns and thoughts about the 0.5 per unit as opposed to the one per unit. And I suppose my concern with, with ratcheting back up is that uh, it is creating more restrictions and it's creating inflexibility for homeowners who are um, separating their, their lot and creating more affordable housing for um, other community members to join Menlo Park. And by requiring them to add up to four units of parking, um, is as a, a an unnecessary restriction. I think that we can let them choose if they want to add all those four lots, four parking lots. We can 
invite them just to add uh, two or up to four if they want to. Um, but I, I'm concerned about adding more restrictions um, when the state, you know, put down SB9 uh, in the wholehearted hope to create more affordable housing. Um, and if a homeowner decided that they were able to create units that didn't have a parking spot and maybe they were even more um, affordable because of that lack of a parking spot. Uh, you know, I, as I mentioned previously, like I live with people who just bike and it is a great fortune to bike. Um, and just because you're able to bike doesn't mean that you're uh, very well paid and can afford a really you know, certain life lifestyle or certain um, apartments, but having access to a space that um, leans into that lifestyle, if that's the one you are able to or choose to live, um, I just don't see why we had, uh, we'd want to create additional uh, restrictions. So thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Taylor, I see your hand raised. Thank you, Mayor Willison. And I am actually supportive of Councilmember Combs um, in this situation. Um, just speaking on behalf of my district, uh, we have about 70% of the population commute out by vehicle um, to work um, or to school because of the public transportation. And I am concerned that we are going to create a standard um, that doesn't fit. It doesn't fit all of Menlo Park. And um, I have a question, knowing that we've had one application approved, um, is that an affordable housing application? It, or do we know, or do we have to wait until the units are actually built to find out if it's actually affordable? Um, so speaking to the one that we've approved, um, to clarify, it was just a subdivision. We haven't seen an actual um, you know, application to build housing units. Um, in that case, uh, since it would be below the five units um, needed to require affordable housing, the city wouldn't be able to require affordable housing. So it'd be, you know, up to the market or the um, the homeowner in that case, what the rent is or sale price, what have you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate um, I appreciate your answer. So we don't even know if SB nine is actually going to produce affordable housing. That's the hope. We can't require it. Um, I don't know if we know for sure if it you know, will produce affordable housing, um, but we as a city can't require it. Thank you. And I have one last question. Um, and is, is there a way a, a year from now uh, to assess um, the, the impacts of SB9 and parking? Or is that something that we were planning on doing? Or does the council need to um, request it? Sorry, can you repeat the question? My my question is, in a, a year from now, can we assess SB9 um, and the impacts on our parking decision has had on Menlo Park? Is there a way to to go back and look at, um, has this been a positive decision or has this impacted the projects in a negative way? Does that make sense? Can we measure what we decide? Is there a way to measure that in a year is my question. It's a good question. Um, we'd have to think about it a little bit. We can you know, certainly track um, in our permit system what projects are SB9 projects. Um, I think it might be a little bit more difficult to quantify you know, how imposing a half a parking space requirement or a one parking space requirement, um, the impacts of that, I think we would need to do a little bit more, um, you know, we would have to think about that as staff as how to quantify that. Thank you, I, I appreciate that response. Um, thank you. And I am still on this side of siding with Council Member Combs on this. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. Um, Council Member Nash. I just want to clarify that this is actually just allowing people to build less parking. It is not requiring them to. So what I am interested in um, learning as we are tracking as we get SB9 projects is what 
parking they choose if in fact this is the um, how much parking they put in. And um, if we do, well, I will just, how many projects, um, what their parking choices are and how that works. And if we, um, I'll stop there. Thank you. So um, I appreciate my colleagues. I appreciate this uh, discussion. Um, you know, when SB9 passed, I look at, I, looked at it as an opportunity to open up new um, housing stock. It is a new law that, as has been stated before through the Turner Center, um, has not produced a ton of development, not only in Menlo Park, but throughout the state. So a lot of this is has a big unknown. And I think we're going to see a lot of iterations. There's some new state laws around SB9 that are going to be coming um, through the legislature. So a lot of our our uh, nitty gritty decisions on some of these aspects of the ordinance might be moot in a couple of years anyway. Um, with that, and this might surprise some of my colleagues, I would love for all of us to have the opportunity to vote yes on this. And I would be um, willing to forego the um, reduced parking requirement um, in the hopes that my colleagues um, would uh, join um, the yes vote on SB9. So I would be willing to go back to the state default um, on the one spot per unit um, if that would um, entice my colleagues to. Join. So what I will, oh, will say, like, again, I, I just want to share my, my uh, concerns and respect wherever the council majority uh, or wherever the council lands. But if it, if it defaults to the one parking spot per unit, then I will definitely vote for it. Um, with that, I'd actually like to make a motion to waive this. Well, actually, staff, um, if my motion is to revert to the one parking space and to go back on what we had said earlier, um, how can I state the motion? Thank you, Mayor. I, I would just state the motion as drafted with the uh, direction that the motion is amended to revert back to the one parking space per unit requirement that was presented at first reading, originally presented at first reading. Thank you. So City Clerk Karen, my motion is what the city attorney just said. Thank you. So is there a second? A second. Thank you. Okay, so I have a motion on the floor by Mayor Willison, a second by City Council Member Combs to waive the second reading and adopt an ordinance amending Title 15 subdivisions and 16 zoning of the Menlo Park Municipal Code in order to make regulations consistent with applicable California law regarding urban lot splits and two unit developments on single family zone parcels and reverting the parking requirement as presented in the first reading. of one spot per unit. Any further city council? Ms. Chow seems like she yes. has something to say. <laughs> Thank you, the benefits of being in person. So I just wanted to clarify that there were some introduction, some uh, modifications that staff introduced um, at the last meeting. Just want to clarify that those do carry over uh, with the one parking space. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chow. Thank you. So any further city council question or discussion? I'll just say that I will be um, voting yes because I am excited about the opportunity to increase our housing stock in Menlo Park, uh, housing of all uh, affordabilities. And so excited to support this with the rest of city council. Thank you. Thank you. So by roll call vote, city council member Combs. Yes. City Council Member Dower. Yes. City Council Member Nash. Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor. Yes. Mayor Willison. Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And thanks again for Council Member Combs for pulling that one for discussion. We have now arrived at regular business. Under regular business, the City Council considers recommendations from city staff on policy matters or administrative actions that require city council approval. The first regular business item is G1, consider an appeal of the Complete Streets Commission approval 
to remove four on-street parking spaces at 660 Roble Avenue. And to introduce this item is our senior transportation engineer, Kevin Chen. Mr. Chen. Good evening, Mayor and fellow council members. Uh, just wanted to mic check real quick to make sure that you guys can hear me okay. Yes, go right ahead, Kevin. Great, okay. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen so they can see my presentation. And Judy, if I can just have a quick confirmation that you're looking at the first page of my presentation in full screen mode. Yep, you're all set. Great, thank you very much. So good evening, everyone. Once again, uh, my name is Kevin Chen, Senior Transportation Engineer with the City of Meadow Park Transportation Division. I'm very happy to be here with you tonight. Uh, tonight, we're here to ask the City Council to consider an appeal of a item that was previously went to our Complete Streets Commission which is regarding its parking, on-street parking removal for 660 uh, Roadway Avenue. So for tonight's agenda, I will briefly go over the background, the project timeline that had happened to, to today, some of the evaluation that have taken place that really stem into the recommendation that we're presenting to you tonight. So here is a quick image of the, uh, the driveway condition that we're looking at to kind of bring the city council up to date in terms of the project status. What we received previously sometime last year was a request from a resident that wanted staff to go out there and evaluate the site distance uh, at adequacy of the driveway that is serving 660 Roble. 660 Roble is currently a building that is a multifamily building serving approximately, I believe, eight, eight, household, eight households. So it is a single uh, serving driveway, meaning one way in, one way out, serving approximately eight families. And because of that request, staff went out there, conducted evaluations for the site, dist uh, the site distance. Typically, what that means is staff will go out there, be at the driveway, and really evaluate the driveway from a driver perspective. So here you can see our two pictures. If you were a driver that is coming out of that driveway, and here we are essentially looking, if you are a driver, you are essentially on the far edge of the sidewalk, meaning if you were to put that in perspective of where the car would be, the front bumper right now would be approximately toward the edge of that park vehicle right there. So that hopefully gives you a, a good picture of where, where the driver would be in this photo. So here to your left, obviously, is the driver looking to your left, which would be uh, towards El Camino. And then the right picture is the driver looking to the right towards Curtis Avenue. So as you can see right now, the, the driver would be pretty much um, looking at parked vehicles on both sides of the driveway uh, without really a, a good clear sight distance. Here is just a screen capture of some of the industry standards that we use to, to evaluate this type of request. Typically when it comes to sight distance evaluation, we wanna look at the speed of the roadway and we also wanted to, we want to look at where the drivers are, both from the minor street, in this case would be the driveway that's serving the, the building, as well as what we would consider to be kind of the major, in this case would be, would be roadway. So in this way, in this case, roadway is considered to be 25 miles per hour, and therefore using our industry standards, the minimum site distance is 155 feet. And to your right is a picture that gives you, you know, approximately what that site distance um, would be, what we're, what we're really evaluating in terms of site distance. So just quickly go over the project timeline. Back in September 14 of 2022, staff brought this item to the Complete Streets Commission, again, at the request of the resident 
to evaluate the, the driveway site distance ad, uh, uh, adequacy. Of course, there was very, um, very much discussions with some of the pros and cons and then some of the evaluation process that went in, which ultimately the complete street commission voted to approve the request, which in this case would be the removal of on-street parking spaces. On September 22nd, the city received an official appeal from one, one of the, the residents on that block. Uh, and and they, unfortunately, the appellant could not be here tonight, but I do want to just kind of bring your attention to the sort of the statement that, that she made in her appeal letter, which also is attached as one of the attachments in the staff report. But generally speaking, I think the statement being made here is that you know, given the relative position of the driveway, which is more to the right of the building, the, the appellant believed that the parking spaces to the left doesn't really quite have the impact that staff had initially indicated. And then that would be kind of the reason for the appeal. Of course, with the appeal, we want to make sure that we, we do our due diligence. So we went out there again, looking at some of the numbers, uh, just trying to see if there's anything else that we, we missed the first time around. And here is a, a quick illustration of the, the thought process that went behind it. Uh, as you can see, this is a, an exact illustration of Roble, the driveway that's serving 660. And as you can see, in order to achieve that minimum distance, which is 155 feet for a roadway that is signed at a, a prima facie speed of 25 miles per hour, you, you kind of do need to remove those on-street parking spaces to, to kind of gain that, gain that side visibility. So with that, our recommendation to you tonight uh, is twofold. Uh, first is to deny the appeal that was brought forth by the appellant. And then second is to adopt the resolution to remove the parking spaces that staff had indicated um, in the staff report as well. And before I conclude my presentation, I just wanted to make sure that I brought to your attention that we did receive two separate uh, common letters from two separate residents. One was uh, in, in opposition of the of staff's recommendation to remove the parking spaces, and, and for, for fairly similar reasons stated from the appellant, uh, given that the, the parking needs are, are quite high there, and the, that particular resident doesn't believe that parking should be removed for that, for that reason. And then the second email that we received uh, while didn't explicit, uh, didn't quite explicitly state it in opposition, there was some concern about if we were to remove parking spaces, what we what, what we would do to the roadway width, and of course, uh, with that, with the if there was a desire to do a traffic calming measure, which I think uh, most of you have, have probably read that comment letter as well. So with that, I will conclude my presentation and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chen. Um, before the council discusses this, we would first like to go to public comment. And I do want to acknowledge that we had, um, I believe Mr. Chen, the emails you were referring to also came to CCIN, which is the council email log um, from, just so that the council is sure there's two emails and they both came from women named Carol. So I just wanna make sure we know that there's two separate emails because um, it might get a little confusing. So um, thank you for those that wrote in and we'll now go to public comment. Uh, City Clerk Heron. Thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item G1, consider an appeal of the Complete Streets Commission's approval to remove four on-street parking spaces at 660 Roble Avenue. Participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return it to the clerk's desk. And our first speaker will be Carol Hyde, followed by John. Honorable Mayor Wolosin and members of the council, thank you for this opportunity to comment on the proposed removal of parking spaces on Roble Avenue. I am Carol Ms. Hyde. Ms. Hyde. Can you please bring the microphone a little closer to your mouth? So we can make sure everyone can hear you. 
I'm Carol Hyde, longtime resident at 675 Robley Avenue, right across the street from the parking spaces at issue. Residents at 675 also find it quite dangerous to pull out onto Robley Avenue. So the issue is not just the parking that obscures the line of vision, it's also the speed of traffic racing along Robley. So I would ask that if you remove parking spaces, you create a more open street. And unless you install traffic calming measures, such as speed humps at the same time, traffic will assume even higher speeds. Cars race down Robley Avenue, trying to catch a green light at El Camino, pedal to the metal, or they have been sitting on El Camino waiting ages for the left arrow and they are impatient and they hurtle back in the other direction. Robley Avenue is more than a conduit for cars to get somewhere else. Robley is a residential neighborhood, habitat to families, people of all ages, toddlers, people on bicycles, dog walkers, wild animals, and pets. I have spoken with your very good people in the police and traffic departments. The police say they don't have the staffing to send to Robley Avenue any staff to ticket speeders. The traffic department requires a bureaucratic process that makes it incumbent on residents to get traffic humps installed. This is the document they send. I'm trying to get through it. I'm not sure why it's up to residents to address public safety issues and initiate campaigns for traffic calming. If you are going to remove parking spaces and create a wider avenue, then really the city needs to install permanent traffic calming measures, such as along Cambridge Avenue in multiple places, and even on the short one block stretch of Crane Street running between Menlo Avenue and Live Oak. Thank you for this opportunity to address this vexing and dangerous issue. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is John, followed by Katie Baruzzi. Hi, uh, this is John Co. Thank you, City Council, uh, for taking my comments. Uh, I would definitely echo Carol's comments. Um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly sympathetic to the um, issues that 660 has pulling out of their driveway. Um, I represent the, there's an HOA of four units at 653 Roble. Um, and we have the kind of fortunate controlled experiment of being directly across the street from 660. Um, none of our residents have an issue pulling out. Uh, I do think what's different is a large uh, tree in the building. And to be clear, what we mean by left side, I think what uh, the appeal meant was the western side of El Camino. That doesn't have any obstruction. Um, but the eastern side towards El Camino, I can understand how uh, there can be issues as evidenced by the picture in the presentation. Um, but I think more broadly, you know, if we're going to address traffic issues and safety issues on Robol, I think tra traffic calming measures are certainly uh, important. And at least for the residents of our HOA, one of the, the larger issues why a lot of us use the street parking, uh, we've gotten uh, special permits from the police department to do so after uh, several damaging um, issues with trees on our property that I know is a separate issue with the arborist and the heritage tree rules. Um, but often as we've had storms like this and in past years, uh, we utilize those on-street parking permits to avoid damage to our cars. Unfortunately, we can't move our houses to, to avoid the same fate. Um, but I think generally I am supportive of parking removal. I think it's a little excessive. Again, controlled experiment across the street. Um, four parking spaces is a lot to take away from that community um, in favor of removing some. Uh, but I'd also really like to see some traffic calming measures there as well if we go about that, that motion. Uh, thank you for your time and I uh, look forward to the conversation. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Katie Baruzzi, followed by Carol Collins. Hi, this is Katie Baruzzi um, from the Complete Streets Commission speaking for myself. And I wanted to provide some context um, for how we were thinking about this. Um, and basically my sense is that um, this is some kind of legal requirement and that the city could be held liable if we are found not to be in compliance and maybe staff can double check my 
understanding of this. Um, but it seems as though if somebody brings to our attention that we're out of compliance with a legal requirement for safety and we don't address it, then we have a liability issue on our hands. Um, but I do feel very sympathetic to the um, issues raised um, by the previous two speakers. And I think since council is thinking about safe streets, that looking at some of these um, longer corridors without many obstructions that people do tend to tear down, um, holistically, it would be great. Um, I'll also note that I think one of the speakers mentioned this, but I definitely saw it in a letter and I saw it, you know, in Street View. Um, and this is a pervasive problem in our community anyway. Um, people are not doing a great job of maintaining their shrubberies and trees um, that also make visibility different, difficult. Um, and finally, I'll say that when this came to Complete Streets, and there have been several of these recently, I think we've all expressed a little bit of frustration um, at something that Mr. Coe mentioned, which is that um, this is, and, and it's not staff's fault. I mean, they they can't fix everything in the city all at once, but it feels a little unscientific right now, our approach where we just sort of wait for people to bring us issues and do an NTMP or something, instead of being more proactive and analyzing where the issues are and then triaging and seeing, okay, well, where are the most accidents in the city if we have five places where people wanna add speed bumps um, or you know, which intersections which of the 500 intersections in our city that have inadequate sight lines are the ones that are actually causing real problems right now? And can we deal with those first? Um, I am hopeful that when we get to the um, the traffic safety plan, the local traffic safety plan um, that our assistant public works director has mentioned to you recently, um, that some of those kinds of more holistic um, issues can be addressed um, and that we can come up with some more proactive and efficient ways um, and equitable ways too, frankly, um, to make sure that issues around the city are being addressed in a timely manner. Um, that said, again, we feel like it was, the onus was on the city once um, it had been elevated that we had a bad sight line issue um, to fix it, which is why we voted to remove the parking as staff suggested. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker will be Carol Collins, and this will be the final call for public comment on regular business item G1. Uh, pardon me, hello. Uh, my name is Carol Collins, and I'm the other Carol, so I wanted to make sure you knew there were two Carols that did not support <laughs> removing the parking in front of 660 Robel. Um, first off, they haven't, solve their own sightline issue of removing a large bush that makes it so you cannot see through the cars anyway, going other driveway. Um, and I do think you really need to consider the whole area for parking. Um, it is a busy street. There's lots of parking overflow from the park, from downtown and doing this one off is incomplete. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you for your comment. So our final speaker will be Tony Crumrine. I wanna thank everybody for their time. I wasn't going to speak, but I just wanted to add to some of the comments that you've already heard. My name is Tony Crumrine. I represent Cook Seafood at 751 El Camino. Um, the real issue is that humongous cypress tree that blocks the site. If anybody's been out there, I've seen people walking uh, their children in strollers almost get hit by cars coming out of there. Uh, I've seen, I mean, that's that's the real problem. I mean, we have, correct me if I'm wrong, there's um, codes in this city that um, address that, that no one has looked at. Uh, chapter 16.64, fences, walls, trees, and hedges. Uh, if you look at 16.64.010, talks about, um, the uh, hedges and fences and so forth of non-residential uh, districts. This would fall into that category. Item four says clear lines of sight for vehicular and pedestrian traffic or other safety factors need to be considered. Um, that is a very dangerous area and that's really their sight problem. The sight problem is that it has nothing to do with those cars like other people have mentioned because if you're gonna remove cars from there, then everywhere in the city has the same problem. I mean, as you drive down that street, any other street, university, anywhere, 
I mean, as, as you heard from other people, John, I think, mentioned it uh, in, when he was talking earlier, that there's no issue with pulling in and out of there. I mean, it, uh, besides the speeding, which happens everywhere. But really, their issue is that massive cypress tree. And not only does it block the sight for those folks, and that's why they have to drive all the way out in the street to be able to, to turn, it actually encroaches on the sidewalk. If you go out there and look at it, it is two to three feet over on that sidewalk. And it's been that way for years. Now, if that was removed or certainly following the code in the ordinance that says that it must not be that high, if it was cut down to a three foot height, you're talking almost 12 feet from where that sidewalk is, where it encroaches back to the building next to them. If that wasn't there, they could be, they could see all the way to the, the street light there at, at um, El Camino. That's the real problem. So now why I'm here is because we're already fighting every single day for people taking our parking spaces because there's nowhere to park. There's nowhere to park. You guys already alluded to the fact that in this entire city, there, I mean, parking is diminishing and people park on our lot every day that we got to run them off, you know, and, and it's only going to make that problem worse. There's nowhere for people to park. So I, I don't think that's the solution here. And I echo some of the other comments that these people made. And I wasn't going to speak tonight because I wanted to hear what was going to happen. But um, you know, I think it's a mistake to remove any spaces there. The first thing that needs to be done is to remove that massive tree. And again, the code calls for that. I mean, if we did the same thing on our driveway, pulling out onto that same street, if we had allowed for these massive bushes to, I mean, that, that's- Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your comment. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. And I'm seeing no further cards or hands. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Heron. So um, at this time, City Clerk Heron, I sent you a photo. Um, can you please broadcast it um, on the screen? It's of the tree that has been referenced multiple times in discussion. Um, I took that picture today when I went out there to check it out. Um, and as you're pulling up the picture of the tree, um, I appreciate the commenter letting us know exactly where in the municipal code to search so that might have given a, a, some help to the city attorney and the city staff. Um, so I would like to direct this question to the city attorney. Um, what uh, power, because I agree with um, the commenter and uh, several of the commenters that when I went to check it out, um, that did seem to be a, a massive issue, that tree. Um, so what power does the city have in terms of getting that cut back or addressed? So we can look further into whether the city has co-enforcement authority to remove or require the removal of the tree. Um, part of that determination, um, as you heard in public comment, may or may not come down to whether or not the, uh, the uh, tree is a tree or a hedge. Um, and part of part of the determination may come down to whether or not the tree in a, or a hedge um, in its current state could be considered a public nuisance. Um, and we have not made a determination on either of those questions um, as of yet, but we we certainly can look into it. Um, I also think I, I do want to turn it if you're through the mayor, if you're okay, to staff, because we did have a discussion earlier about whether or not that is a viable option for uh, creating a, um, a greater uh, sa safety and line of sight. And I think the staff uh, might have a desire to weigh in on that. Thank you. Yes, please. Can, can I just one quickly about the tree? Do we know whose parcel the tree is on? Like, like is it is it the apartment building or or is it the the sort of commercial uh, structure? Huh? Or, yeah. So, because I I, I do. So that's the commercial problem. Okay, because in that, because in theory, those residents should have gone to yes. the but to the owner of their their apartment, but they didn't because that tree is not not right. theirs. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Combs. So I'd love to hear staff's um, thoughts on this topic. Great, thank you, Mayor. So yes, the in terms of the cypress tree, certainly there is a site issue with regard to pedestrians, which I believe one of the one of the speakers spoke to about 
which certainly is uh, the topic of discussion, could be the topic of discussion. But given that the original request was about set distance relative to cars driving up and down a roadway versus cars that are trying to exit the driveway, the, the tree would essentially have no bearing um, in terms of for, for that conversation, acknowledging that it does have a conversation. It could be a conversation with regard to pedestrians walking. In Wait, so, sorry, Mr. Um, Chen. So yeah. you're saying that the tree has no bearing on the site issues for vehicles exiting the, the complex? That, that we were looking at because, and, and if I can go ahead and share my screen with you, I think that will probably be a little bit clearer in terms of what I'm speaking about. Um, sorry, my apologies. So as you can see from here, um, this is uh, the, dri the driver in this case is well past the tree. The, the driver is now well past the tree. You are essentially kind of sitting right on top of the sidewalk of you know, the sidewalk portion of the driveway. And this is where you're looking at, looking left towards El Camino, right? So uh, the tree in this case is, is not in play at all. But I, I do want to acknowledge that the tree does come into play relative to people that are walking on there on the sidewalk coming from El Camino. And if a car is coming out, you know, it's hard for them to see a pedestrian walking, but, which will we'll address that separately. So, so Mr. Chen, I think those of us on the dais are struggling a little bit here because I think there's like engineering, and this is not directed at you personally. Right. There's engineering guidelines that you have about where you measure the sight distance. Mm -hmm. And then there's kind of, I think what we're all feeling, human behavior of where you wanna look in terms of finding the site. Mm -hmm. um, and I think many of us visited it, the site or have been looking at photos and, and whatnot, and we're feeling that this is a vehicular issue as well. Is there um, engineering judgment that can also go into sightline issues? Because it, it doesn't sync up to, I think, what we, at least I'm seeing some nods up here, what, what it feels like to us as as we get that it's a pedestrian sidewalk issue, but it does feel like it's also a vehicular issue. Absolutely. And and in this case, and, and maybe it's just that uh, we're, we're not quite talking, maybe I'm just misunderstanding kind of the vehicle issue that, that you are talking about in this case. Uh, so so when we are doing that study, we're coming from a perspective of a driver, right? So you're, you're typically, you know, no more than three and a half feet or four feet above ground when you're sitting in a car. So that, that's, that's kind of just kind of get that out of the way. I, I would probably look at this from a perspective of uh, someone, oh, I'm sorry, just click on the image where I'm not supposed to. Uh, I, I would like the best personal experience would be if you're coming to a stop sign, you are supposed to stop behind a stop bar first, make sure that there's no pedestrians in, in the crosswalk. And if you can't see the, the road to your left or to the right, now you start encroaching into the crosswalk. And if you can't, still cannot see to your left or to your right, now you're encroaching more into the street until you are at a point where you felt safe enough to see cars coming from your left and your right to make that turn. So in this case, I would kind of consider that to be the same case. The cypress, the cypress tree, would, I would equate that to maybe where the stop bar would be. And that's where the pedestrian question certainly is uh, something to be to be uh, worth discussing a little bit more. So you kind of get to the tree, you, obviously you can't see what's to your left, now you encroach more further into the crosswalk, I'm sorry, into the sidewalk, still can't see anything, and now you are looking at the picture where I show, I showed you earlier, where you are essentially kind of- Yeah, I think, right Mr. Chen, I think what we're gonna, let's just say hypothetically for a minute that the tree gets trimmed, back quite a bit mm -hmm. wouldn't there be wouldn't the sight line appear earlier for the driver and make it better for the driver not necessarily it depends on how far back you want to see now you might be able to see um as the one of the one of the speakers say oh you can see a signal at El Camino which is certainly correct but you still cannot see cars driving towards you uh I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, you can see further out, but you, you're not seeing a car that's driving towards you within, say, 155 feet or so, because 
there's a, a line of cars parked on the street that's blocking your view. You can see maybe 300 feet out, but you won't be able to see what's within, say, 155 feet. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chen. I'm seeing a lot of shaking heads on the dais. Um, and again, this is not directed at Mr. Chen. This is engineering standard. So whatever comes at you right now is just us being curious. Um, it looks like uh, Vice Mayor Taylor has a question. Um, thank you, Mayor Willison. And it, I'm not sure if this is a question more than more a comment. Um, and, and that is number one, it's obvious this tree needs to be trimmed. That's that's yeah, obvious. I, I agree, it's, Vice Mayor Taylor. Or so until that happens, it just it it doesn't make sense to do anything. This that should be the first thing that's done. Um, the second is I agree with the two um, public commenters about looking at um, the whole area as opposed to doing these one-offs. Um, I'm not sure who brought this to Complete Streets to review, um, but I I'm concerned about just coming and removing parking in order to give more visibility when there's one big issue, um, the tree around visibility, um, not just the engineering, but also I can't imagine coming out and trying to make a left turn. Um, so I probably wouldn't make a left turn, I'd make a right turn. But um, so those are a couple things to address, um, I, I think, um, just to kind of kick off the conversation. What I'm hoping is that this doesn't turn into an hour discussion. <laughs> Okay, that's fair. Um, Council Member Doerr. I'd like to ask our city attorney, um, given the, the engineering guidelines, are, are, what kind of requirements do we have as a city to uh, address this in the specific way that, um, uh, but by removing the parking or anything, any details you can share that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Council Member Doerr. So there are guidelines and best practices here, but there's no mandatory legal obligation on the part of the city to remove the parking, um, given the line of sight best practices that staff has articulated. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. Council Member Combs. Yeah, so do we do we have to take action here? Can we just say, uh, send this back to staff um, to, to look at other mitigations? Um, as it relates to this the, the situation, I do want to say, and again, thank you again, Mr. Chen, um, for, for for the presentation. Um, what concerns me is that, though, to some degree, the entirety of the Complete Streets Commission is seen as differently than what it seems as though the entirety of the City Council, <laughs> and that is, Mr. Chen is doing his job, and and I appreciate that, like, but that gives me a little bit more pause and concern, but. I think to the vice mayor's point, uh, it's I, I I see lots of lots of issues here, and I, I won't I don't think it's worth digging in, and and I, I don't think we're going to move forward tonight with re removing parking. Yeah, I would venture to say it's not an elephant in the room; it's a hedge in the room. Ha ha. Um, so to Councilmember Combs' point, uh, staff um, or city manager or city attorney, can we direct you to engage in whatever? issue we've addressed on the dais tonight and then for this to return? Sure. So there is an appeal before you. So the council does need to make a, a decision on the uh, on the appeal, which just relates to the removal of the parking. Separately from that, we have this issue of can we solve the problem through the hedge slash tree? And that you can certainly provide us direction on. But the hedge slash tree is not before you on appeal tonight. Um, I think what our question is, can we de just um, delay the appeal question until we have had an opportunity to assess once the hedge issue has been addressed? I, I, I will probably let the city manager address that. Legally, yes, you can delay. You don't have to make a decision on the appeal tonight. You could continue it. Okay, I see Vice Mayor Taylor and then Council Member Combs. Mayor Wilson, I'd, I'd love to hear from the city manager. He, he may answer um, what I was actually going to ask. Fabulous. City Manager Murphy, did you want to jump in there? I apologize if I cut you off. Let's see. I, uh, th thank you, Mary. I have no, no idea whether I will be answering the question that was about to be asked, but I could um, mm -hmm. speak to the earlier um, statement, I think. So I'd actually like to make an, a motion to uphold the appeal. 
Um, so that that denies the parking removal because either way, if I'm if I'm pulling out, the removal of the parking to the right makes absolutely no sense. Th that situation exists hundreds of places in the city, and there was no logic in the staff report that I saw that made that make sense. And so seeing, seeing as though this is all one thing, then again, my my motion is to uphold the appeal because under no circumstances would I ever be supportive of, of removing that parking unless we are then going to ask for an analysis of the hundreds of spots over across the city where that also exists and where we should remove that parking. So again, that that would be my my motion. And, and I think we can have a discussion about, again, pulling out the left-hand parking um, and about whether sight lines or visibility can be increased with, with um, uh, and it's a massive Italian cypress trees. I have some little ones at my house and maybe in 50 years, they'll look that nice, but, um, but we, can, we can have a discussion about like that. But as it relates to, to all of the, the, the removal that's, that, that's um, on the table here, again, like I, I would move that, that we uphold the appeal. So that's a motion on the floor. Okay. Is there more uh, council discussion? Uh, Vice Mayor Taylor, we were going to go back to you. I'll second. Um, so I just want to say that um, the comments that were made this evening, kind of a little separate from the parking removal and sightline issue about traffic calming and about residents having to proactively ask for our community to be safe are, are well taken. I completely agree. We have actually asked staff to return to us um, with our what's called our NTMP, Neighborhood Traffic Management Program. I believe, at least for me, with the intent of making it much easier and allowing staff much more discretion to move forward with traffic calming in, in easier and faster ways. So that I believe is um, on a future agenda. So stay tuned for that. Um, but any other comments then before we go to a vote or staff, uh, city attorney, do you have any other comments you'd like to make? Yeah, so um, we have a resolution to deny the appeal before the council tonight. We would need to bring a resolution back upholding the appeal um, based on the comments that the council um, provided tonight, staff will redraft the resolution, bring it back um, with a upholding of the appeal, and then the council will vote on that. Can In the meantime, can staff p potentially investigate what is possible regarding the hedge in question or tree or whatever the green thing is? Uh, yes, the staff can investigate that. I don't know the exact timeline. That's fair. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. If there's no other discussion, uh, City Clerk Karen, I believe we're ready. Uh, Council Wait, Member Combs? But can we vote? Because you said that there is... Right. There... We are not voting. You're, you're not, but I, I not... think we have direct... Okay, well, I'll I let apologize. the City Clerk answer if she has the direction she needs to bring it up. Yeah, uh, thank you, City Attorney. Yeah, I don't believe a motion is going to be required. Um, we do have direction to redraft the resolution upholding the appeal um, and directing staff to investigate the cypress tree removal um, as time permits. It could be a hedge. So or, tree hedge. or hedge. Okay. Shrub, hedge, thank greenery. You. <laughs> thank you, City Clerk Karen. Thank and you. thank you to members of the public um, for engaging on this topic. Um, I hope you can see that we take your concerns very seriously and we're trying to come up with the best solution we can. Um, so with that, we're actually going to take a short break right now. Um, we'll take a break until 7.50, a seven minute break, and then we will continue with our regular business items. So thank you.
Okay, having our city council back on our in-person and virtual days. Mayor Willison, you may reconvene the meeting. Thank you, City Clerk Heron. We are moving on to G2, our next regular business item, which is to amend the fiscal year 2022-2023 budget. And to introduce this item, oh, exciting, is our new Administrative Services Director, Brittany Mello. Welcome, Ms. Mello. Hi, Looking hello. Looking forward Thanks to hearing so from you. Very much appreciate it. Uh, so I believe I'm sharing my sc screen, but this is my first time and it doesn't look like it is sharing. Let's double check. Pardon me. Share. And is that working? Terrific. All right, thank you so much. So I am pleased to present the proposed fiscal year 2022-23 budget amendments for your consideration. As the council knows, the budget is a living document. So mid-year budget reviews are part of the standard budgeting process to account for changes authorized from various council actions throughout the year and to incorporate updated revenues and expenditures as new information becomes available. So staff will be providing a high level overview for you tonight and more detailed information is presented in the staff report and the various attachments. And so tonight's presentation will focus on the general fund as it's the largest operating fund in the city. We'll take a look at the year to date activity as well as the year end forecast. And then we'll review the key budget amendments by department. So starting with the general fund year to date activity, this is a snapshot of where the general fund was at as of December 31st, 2022. You'll see there is a temporary surplus of about 2.7 million. And this is primarily due to a higher vacancy rate than anticipated with only 191 current full-time equivalents or FTEs versus 250 FTEs that were budgeted out of the general fund as well as higher than expected investment earnings to date. This temporary surplus will be drawn down by the close of the fiscal year, as many revenues and expenses hit our books in the latter part of each fiscal year. And so the council can really think of this as a snapshot of when you look at your bank account after you received your paycheck, but before you have paid all your bills. For the fiscal year end forecast for June 30th, 2023, we started the fiscal year with a budgeted deficit of 6.4 million and are currently projecting a deficit of just 15,000. This is primarily due to the higher than budgeted anticipated revenues of 1.6 million, as well as significant labor cost savings of 5.2 million. Of note, this forecast does incorporate the proposed mid-year budget amendments before you this evening. I also wanted to take a moment to highlight that we are anticipating future economic uncertainty, which may impact our forecasts as we head into the upcoming fiscal year 2023-24 budget cycle. And so on a national level, we have rising interest rates due to uncertainty in the financial markets. We have continued supply chain impacts and recent banking collapses with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, among many other factors. On a regional level, the technology industry has been experiencing uh, turmoil with Meta recently announcing a plan to lay off an additional 10,000 employees. And so this graph really is meant to help summarize the overall picture that we're forecasting a nearly balanced general fund at the end of the fiscal year with 76.66 million in expenses offset by 76.65 million in revenues and that deficit almost completely disappearing with just 15,000 remaining. And so moving on to the general fund reserves, there are multiple impacts to the reserve levels and those are shown in detail in table one of the staff report. These include decreases to the project related reserves from 1.5 million to 0.5 million due to the Menlo Park Atherton Education Foundation grant. The strategic pension reserve also decreases from 3.2 million to 2.2 million, with 1 million put towards reducing the unfunded accrued liability, or UAL, with CalPERS per previous council direction. 
Then the economic stabilization reserve was adjusted from 16 million to 16.7 million, and that is in compliance with the reserve limits set by council priority or policy. And as a result of these movements between reserve components, the forecasted unassigned fund balance increases from 0.9 million to 2.1 million. And so next we'll dive into the proposed mid-year budget amendments. And so the proposed amendments by department are summarized here on the slide and presented in detail in attachment B and presented by fund in attachment C. I'll be reviewing the primary drivers in each department at a high level, and then staff is happy to dive into any individual items further during the council discussion. For the non-departmental category, there is 5.5 million in revenue adjustments. The bulk of this amendment is related to the disbursement of 4.1 million in the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, funds from the federal government. It's important to note that the discussion regarding the use of ARPA funds will be brought back for City Council consideration during the fiscal year 2023-2024 budget development process that will be taking place over the next few months. Staff is aware of the Council's direction from their June 28th, 2022 meeting to dedicate a portion of these funds for residents of Menlo Park. And as a reminder, ARPA funds must be fully expended by December 31st, 2024. Additionally, in the non-departmental category, there is a proposed $1 million disbursement from the California Employers Retiree Benefit Trust, which is currently overfunded. These funds can only be put towards healthcare premiums. Oops, Oop. my apologies. Moving on to the city manager's office, the primary amendment is related to the 1 million Menlo Park Atherton Education Foundation grant, as well as the storm related hotel reimbursements. For three of the departments you see on the screen, administrative services, public works, and the police departments, there are proposed amendments that are related to overtime and temporary staffing budgets. As the council recalls from uh, earlier in my presentation, there is higher than anticipated vacancy rate in city positions, which resulted in labor cost savings of 5.5 million. Since these departments had anticipated filling many of these positions, they did not budget for the additional overtime and temporary help expenses that would be needed to help meet all of our operational demands. And so these two items are directly related. If we dive into the library and community services department. There are amendments to add expenses related to grants that the city has received for both Big Lift and the Bellhaven Child Development Center, as well as an appropriation for the Bellhaven Community Development Fund mini grant program. For community development, this amendment is for cleanup of processing fees related to building permit payments that were not previously accounted for, as we have in other departments, as well as for housing element consulting services. For public works, in addition to the staffing expenses that I discussed earlier, there is a need to establish a budget for the city's water accounts. This would provide improved accounting for existing expenses. Additionally, public works staff has incurred significant expenses related to storms and replacing parks and landscaping equipment. And finally, for the capital projects category, this is a single amendment to establish a budget for the main library improvement project on the revenues and expenditure side. And so overall, the total proposed amendments equate to a net change of 2.36 million across all funds. And so with that, staff is recommending adoption of the fiscal year 2022-23 mid-year budget amendments. As a preview of next steps in the budget development process, the fiscal year 2023-24 budget principles and direction for the upcoming budget will um, occur on April 25th and continue through June of this year. The public budget workshop will be held on June 1st. The public hearing is scheduled for June 13th, and the final adoption of the budget is scheduled for June 27th. And as mentioned, this process will include a determination and use of the remaining American Rescue Plan Act funds. So online, we have Interim Finance Director Marvin Davis available for questions, along with many members of our management team. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions.
Thank you very much, Ms. Mello, for that overview of the budget amendments. And um, at this time, before we ask our questions and have our discussion, um, City Clerk Karen, can you please call for public comment on this item? Yes. Thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on item G2, amend the fiscal year 2022-23 budget, Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at the back table and return to the clerk's desk. This will be the final call for public comment on item G2. Seeing no hands or cards, Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. Um, I'm actually going to kick it off with a couple of questions, um, Ms. Mello. Mm -hmm. um, one is about the hotel reimbursements under the city manager's line item. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the staff report, it shows that the city manager's amendments included the MPAEF um, one million dollars. That's for the schools mm -hmm. um, and and various other items and the. Um, line item for the hotel reimbursement also included the community funding subcommittee um, approval. So do you have an, and that I believe is $10,000. So does that, um, does that mean that there's $70,000 that we expended on the hotel reimbursements during the storms or how much have we spent on the hotels for storm relief? Um, Stephen Stolte, our assistant city manager, I believe has more information on that item. Thank you. Yes. So we have offered three rounds of hotel reimbursements so far this season through the storms. And currently our finance department is working through the first batch of submittals for reimbursement. So that $70,000 was an approximate amount for the total number of submissions we had at the time when we created this. Um, I, I do believe that should be a sufficient amount to cover all the reimbursements. Okay, so you don't think it'll go over $70,000? I after you know, season. fingers okay. crossed we don't get okay. additional storms, but yeah. Okay, but I, <laughs> I do want to point out for residents, um, we've had many questions. I know council members have gotten emails, text calls from upset residents who understandably are extremely frustrated with the situation. I do want to just highlight how I think responsive the city was in offering that um, generous reimbursement. Um, the first round, I believe we didn't even have an income kind of requirement. We kind of rethought that, I think, and, and put one in. But um, I just wanted to thank staff for developing that program and just letting residents know that I don't think other cities got that. So, um, so that was my first comment. Let me just finish, and then I think other council members will want to weigh in. Um, uh, Ms. Mello, there's an item here about city water accounts. Um, so is this just for general fund or does it also include our water fund? Because it's my understanding that kind of water money sits separate than city money. Uh, so uh, Marvin Davis might jump in with more information. Um, my understanding is that this is just for the water that our own city facilities use. And so that wouldn't necessarily be related to the, Got the enterprise of the water fund. Thank you for that clarification. That makes perfect sense. Um, and then I know there are a lot of residents um, who are following along, who followed the priority setting workshop that we held, who wrote in advocating for various items. Um, and we went in a very strategic way with our priority setting. And work plan developments coming and then budget setting is coming. So for those residents who are tracking and wanting to make sure that their priorities to see if it falls within the budget or not, should they then be paying attention on April 25th and then again on June 1st? Or um, what's the what can we tell folks of how to stay involved? Yes, we would encourage everyone to participate um, as many times as they're able. We have our budget principles adoption before the council on April 25th, which should be a robust discussion. And then the June 1st, uh, we'll be presenting uh, what we have thus far in um, putting together the budget and then the public hearing on June 13th as well. So there are um, four opportunities to provide feedback. Thank you. And when, so when will the first kind of Ta-da 
of what's getting in. Is that going to be a couple of days before when a staff report gets released? Um, or um, on June 1st, we'll be, uh, presenting the public transparency portal or that will go live. And so um, the public can dig in via that portal. Uh, and then we'll be going over that in detail at the workshop. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Mellon. Um, Ms. Mello. So um, the city council member Nash, you wanted to say something, I believe. I was just going to jump in while you were talking about the hotel reimbursements and say I had several emails from residents who were really um, heartfelt thanks for those hotel reimbursements, um, including one who said that it really shows where the city, um, how the city prioritizes residents. And it just thank you to staff. I know it's been a tremendous amount of work and that um, it was a great idea and really very, very strongly appreciated from residents and council. Um, and I do have one question about that. It, is there any chance of getting a reimbursement from PG&E for that? I know that Mayor Willison at the um, at one meeting specifically mentioned that to PG&E, and I'm hoping we're taking advantage of that. I may toss that item over to our city manager or assistant city manager. Uh, yes, I'll. I'll uh, say that we will uh, we will attempt uh, to do that for sure. Yes. Thank you, City Manager Murphy. Um, Vice Mayor Taylor, Council Member Store or Combs, any comments on the budget? Is there a motion then, to, uh, City Clerk Karen? You're looking for a motion to adopt? Yes, it's a resolution. So is there a motion to adopt the resolution? Councilmember Combs. I move. I second. I second. I believe Vice Mayor Taylor was having audio issues, but she beat you to it, Councilmember Dorr. So we'll have the first from Councilmember Combs and a second from Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Combs, a second by Vice Mayor Taylor to adopt a resolution to amend the fiscal year 2022-23 budget. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, city council member Combs? Yes. City council member Dower? Yes. City council member Nash? Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mayor Willison? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're now going to our third and final regular business item, which is G3. Adopt a resolution to approve amendments to the salary schedule as of April 9th, 2023, related to and supporting Menlo Park Community Campus supervision, programs, and operations. And to introduce this item is our Library and Community Services, Services Director, Sean Reinhardt. Mr. Reinhardt. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Good evening, uh, City Council. Uh, joining me with this for this presentation, um, again, is uh, Ms. Mello, the Administrative Services Director. Uh, it's wonderful to be here tonight before you to um, discuss this item, salary schedule amendments related to and supporting the Menlo Park Community Campus Supervision and Operations. Um, the recommendation here is uh, that the City Council adopt uh, the resolution to approve these amendments to the City of Menlo Park salary schedule. Um, one is to update the position title with no change in salary range to Library and Community Services Manager the second one is to update a position title with no change to the salary range to assistant library and community services director. Now, the third one is, is kind of optional. It's not uh, required, but just more like cleanup of the salary schedule would be to delete the assistant community services director, assuming that one and two um, also take place. And again, these would not uh, result in any change in the city's current total authorized full-time equivalent headcount. Uh, just a picture of the Library and Community Services Department from our department retreat last year. A wonderful group of folks. I think this is most of them. There are a few more not shown. Um, there are immediate critical ne and critical needs in uh, the Library and Community Services Department. Um, in particular, there's a management level position that has been staffed on an interim basis for over 16 months, continuing to staff that key management role on an interim basis um, is 
uh, unsustainable at this point, 16 months in, it's becoming increasingly challenging to the city's capabilities to effectively execute on the desired goals of that very important project, the MPCC, as well as other city priorities that touch the Library and Community Services Department. Uh, with every vacancy, we evaluate the organization's current and future personnel needs prior to moving forward with the recruitment. Um, as you all know, we're very intensely occupied with preparations for opening the new Menlo Park Community Campus facility slated to open in less than a year. Um, and in particular, qualified and effective oversight of that new facility uh, is very important uh, and critical to its success. As you know, that facility will include a library, a recreation center, senior center, school-aged childcare and aquatics in one facility. So quite a range of disciplines there for the building manager um, uh, to oversee. Uh, ideally, that level of oversight would be put in place up to 12 months in advance of the new facility opening. This would allow the manager to meaningfully engage in the planning and operations for the startup operations in the new facility. Fortunately, we do have a, a number of staff internally who have been working on that project. Um, and of course, internal advancement of our current personnel is a, is a, is a big goal of ours. So this is an opportunity there as well. Um, if City Council authorizes these salary schedule amendments tonight, they would be effective April 9th. At the current rate of recruitment, it's anticipated to be three to six months to onboard the new manager. That's taking us pretty deep into this calendar year and pretty close to the opening. Succession planning and organizational resiliency is incredibly important um, throughout the city organization and in the library and community services department. Um, this allows us to continue to deliver high quality services to the community on a perpetual basis. The city is a perpetual institution and we need to preserve institutional knowledge um, as we move forward through the years. Uh, so we continually take proactive steps to identify and develop new leaders from within the organization in particular, as well as to attract qualified talent from the local community and beyond where, where needed. Um, and we prepare those emerging leaders to seamlessly advance to leadership roles like the ones Brittany and I are in and that we're grateful for. Um, so when current leadership transitions out of the organization, those emerging leaders are prepared to step into those roles seamlessly. So regarding the positions themselves, there are two of them that are really key um, that we're asking the city council to um, basically update some existing titles um, uh, with no change to the salary range, also at the management level, so no change there. So the first is library and community services manager. Um, this position would have oversight of multiple synergistic functions within the library and community services department. Again, think Menlo Park Community Campus and the many disciplines that will be in that same facility. Um, the portfolio of the individual would depend somewhat on the skills and abilities that they possess, but one combination could be libraries, childcare, and senior services in their portfolio, or it could be um, recreation, sports, gymnastics, aquatics, um, other combinations. Importantly, for that organizational resiliency that I spoke of, the LCS manager classification could be assigned to any combination of those responsibilities as needed. So it really does encompass all of the department's functions. And this is uh, similar to the uh, library and community services supervisor level, which the city council approved a couple of years ago for, for the same reason. Um, the LCS manager would report directly to the assistant director or the department head. Uh, the other um, change before you tonight is the proposed assistant library and community services director. This would be changing uh, the assistant library services director classification to library and community services assistant director. This would combine the scopes of the assistant library services director and the assistant community services director classifications. Those are already very similar in scope. Uh, the assistant LCS director, if approved by council, would have oversight for all the department programs, functions, and activities, not just one half or the other. Uh, they would develop and imp implement and interpret public policy across the department. They would serve as a de deputy to the department head, reporting directly to the department head, and would serve as the acting department head across the whole department in the absence of the department director. Also very critical at this point in our um, progress toward opening the new MPCC. There is no impact to the city's general fund associated with the requested action. The proposed salary schedule revisions would not result in any change to the city's current total authorized full-time equivalents nor to salary ranges. Um, as noted in the staff report, um, here are uh, the proposed changes. 
Again, the deletion is, is not necessary. It's really just kind of clean up. And again, here's that recommendation. And with that, happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Reinhart. Um, so before we turn it over to council, City Clerk Karen, can you please open it up for public comment? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on item G3, adopt a resolution to approve amendments to the salary schedule as of April 9th, 2023, related to and supporting Menlo Park Community Campus Supervision Programs and Operations, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to the clerk's desk. This will be the final call for public comment on regular business item G3. And our first speaker will be Pam Jones. Good evening, Mayor Olson, council members and staff. Um, I may have missed it, but do are there people currently in these positions or similar positions that will have to reapply in order to um, uh, to, to maintain their employment. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. <laughs> okay, seeing no further hands or cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Heron. Um, so I actually have two questions. One is a follow-up from Ms. Pam Jones. And the second is a question about um, how these new titles and new positions fit into like an org chart, because it's hard to, without the context, kind of see where we're going, what have you. Thank you for the question. So to the first question, uh, no current employees would be displaced from their employment uh, by any means. Uh, this, uh, this new classification would create opportunities for internal advancement for current employees. Um, there um, is a, an individual who is in an acting management role who um, would certainly be, uh, we would be strongly interested in seeing that individual apply for this position for certain. Um, they are a current employee of the city, who's, uh, kind of serving in an out of class assignment for the past 16 months. So regardless of the outcome, you know, of that process, they would still remain an employee of the city. Uh, but I, I just do want to add that um, the city is, is fortunate to have uh, several current personnel who have extensive experience working in and serving the Bell Haven neighborhood who would be qualified and competitive in an open recruitment and all of our management recruitments are open recruitments uh, for the proposed library and community services manager position. Uh, in addition to qualified external candidates or in particular local ones who might apply, but uh, we're just very fortunate to have folks with that, that direct experience serving the neighborhood who would be qualified and uh, we believe interested in applying. Um, to your second question, how would this fit into um, the organizational chart? The Library and Community Services Department currently has uh, three management positions. Um, uh, the director, um, the assistant library services director, the assistant community services director. So this would really kind of keep that, that same structure, but provide far more flexibility um, in the assistant director range because the assistant library and community services director, as well as the assistant library and community services manager, those classifications would be such that uh, the individuals could be um, assigned to any one of the department's functions across the board, not just limited to kind of one half or the other. Sorry, can you repeat what the three um, management roles are again? Yes, uh, so or... there's the library and community services director, and then there are two assistant directors, assistant library services director and assistant community services director, which are holdovers from uh, before the pandemic and before the departments combined. So would this new classification then convert those two folks who are currently the assistants, one in library services and one in community services, they'd get this new title 
is it, is it, uh, them, the, is it those? I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say to the individual level, but the the classifications. Yes, there would continue to be those three management roles. However, the two would now become broad based, where they could supervise any of the functions within the department. There is an individual who's serving in an interim role, um, and that individual, like with any recruitment, they need to go through a recruitment process to be placed in the role. Sure, permanently. sorry, I, didn't, I guess I didn't mean specific individual, just as the placeholder of the role. So yes. is one of the two, so is this director, that's you, right? That's me. Okay, okay. And then you have two assistant directors right now. Correct. So those two assistant directors that are those one of those assistant directors is currently an interim position correct i see and so this then gives you flexibility to flexibility around those two assistant positions uh, correct and brings the the classifications themselves up to date with the current structure of the department which is library and community services i'll just give an example one of the one of the two assistant directors has actually supervised every division within the department over the past three years. However, their classification is is very much, um, as it's currently written, really on only describing one half of the department because, it's, again, it's a holdover from before the departments combined in 2020. And then the, the managers then, they go under the assistant directors? Uh, in a manner of speaking, I, I think it, they, they could uh, report either to the uh, an assistant director or to the director. Really, it kind of depends on the workload and having uh, a, a good span of control. The number of direct reports for each you know individual who who is a manager. Okay, so this, the intent of this is way back when, maybe five years ago. At some point, we merged the two. I don't remember when that was. Uh, about three, three okay, years ago. It was ago. right before the pandemic. It yeah. was a, kind of as an outcome of the pandemic. Okay, okay. We merged it. And so this is just catching up on some classifications. Yes. And, and also preparing for the Menlo Park Community Campus, which is sort of the physical embodiment of the combined department and to have uh, effective management oversight there where written into their classification is the responsibility to oversee all of those five functions. Okay. Thank you. I think I've been hogging the time and I, I see Council Member Nash might have a question. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, Council Member Combs. Yeah, it's just a point of, of, of clarification of the history as, as I remember it um, during the staff reduction. Um, right there, there was a, a decision made to um, uh, to combine the community services and library services and, and thereby getting um, um, removing the need for two department heads. Um, I, I vaguely remember that as being an artifact of the pandemic and, and not necessarily that that was something that the decision had been made was we were just committing to as, as the new structure. Now, all that being said, I, Obviously, I'm on council. I'm not on staff. It seems as though we have committed to that, and and I'm not saying that I needed that memo. But at the time the decision was made, I didn't I didn't read it as this was a permanent change. It looks as it is a permanent change. I have no objection to it, but that's just the history as I remember it. Uh, Councilmember Nash, thank you for all the information. Is the intent to have it to be able to have one or two assistant directors and one or two managers realizing you only have two open headcount but some but you could use the headcount in either of those positions or is there what is the plan yeah i think i think can. no that's that's good and i appreciate the question um in particular as it regard uh, pertains to succession planning i think the the, probably the ideal state, and again, it really depends on the individuals you know involved and the skills and experience that they possess. Um, would be you know, one director, one assistant director, and then one manager, because it just sort of kind of completes the the series and creates that succession planning 
uh, paths to advancement internally into the leadership of the organization. So then again, that we have that organizational resiliency, that continuity of knowledge and so forth. Just, thank you. I just, it was confusing whether how many, how many positions there were other than I knew how many FTEs were approved. So, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to clarify. Any other comments, questions? Councilmember Dorr, Vice Mayor Taylor. Councilmember Dorr. Yeah, thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, I just want to echo and uh, share back what I've shared previously of a lot of excitement for what the library and community services um, uh, team is doing and really excited to uh, see the team staffed up properly to support this great work, to see the MPCC launch later this year or early next year. Um, and so really excited for that and appreciate your leadership. Thank you. Vice Mayor Taylor, anything? No, thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Reinhardt. Um, I love the picture of the department. It's really heartwarming to see those smiling faces. Um, it's just such a great department. Um, my uh, future request for, um, and this would be to, to any kind of salary amendments um, for Ms. Mello probably, when they do come forward, it's helpful for us to have the context of kind of org charts so we can see, I think, how it fits. Um, just for us to have that that visualization, uh, it can be really helpful. Um, but I believe there's no more comments or questions. And so um, you are looking for a resolution to be adopted to amend the salary schedule. Okay, so um, I can go ahead and make that motion. Is there a second? Oh. Second. Okay. Okay, so I have a motion on the floor by Mayor Woolison and a second by City Council Member Combs to adopt a resolution to approve the following amendments to the City of Menlo Park salary schedule. Update position title with no change to salary range for the Library and Community Services Manager. Update position title with no change to salary range for the Assistant Library and Community Services Director and delete Assistant Community Services Director. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, City Council Member Combs. Yes. City Council Member Doer. Yes. City Council Member Nash. Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor. Yes. Mayor Willison. Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. We have now reached H informational items. Uh, Mayor Willison, we do yes. have one more regular item. Oh my goodness, you are right. I was jumping the gun here. Thank you, City Clerk Heron. You're right. We do have one more regular business item, and that's about us. So um, this is item G4, appoint city council members to various standing and ad hoc subcommittees and disband inactive ad hoc subcommittees. And City Clerk Heron, you're on deck to introduce this item. Thank you, Mayor Willison. Um, and hello, City Council. I'm your City Clerk. Uh, the item before you tonight is requesting the City Council action on a couple of items related to City Council subcommittees. The first is a request to disband the inactive subcommittees. Staff is also requesting that the City Council appoint members to the active standing and ad hoc subcommittees for calendar year 2023. And lastly, the City Council may wish to appoint ad hoc subcommittees to the two pending development projects currently requesting development agreements. Those two projects are the Parkline Project at Ravenswood Ave and the Commonwealth 3 Project on Jefferson Drive. That concludes my introduction and happy to answer any clarifying questions or open for public comment. Thank you. So um, I can turn it. Oh, let's open it for public comment, please, City Clerk Karen. Thank you. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comments on item G4, appoint city council members to various standing and ad hoc subcommittees and disband inactive ad hoc subcommittees, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card and return it to the clerk's desk. 
And our first speaker will be Jenny Michelle. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, Council Members, staff, uh, neighbors. Um, my name is Jenny Michelle from the Coleman Place Neighborhood Block. And when I was just reviewing this, my only question is, um, although these projects are technically like not act, some of these are not active and on, you know, our, our radar, I'm just wondering if there's any type of um, staff scope that's um, going to be tracking any of the progress or um, milestone, like I, I just, you know, making sure that things stay on track as negotiated, you know, um, if there's an opportunity for um, the, the city to get back involved in some of these projects, I guess that's that's my only concern, um, but otherwise I totally agree with the staff's recommendations and I think you guys are awesome and uh, I just wanna thank you so much. Okay, bye. Thank you for your comment. Okay, and this will be the final call for public comment on regular business item G4. Seeing none, Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen, and thank you, Ms. Michelle, for your question. Um, I think um, it might be a good time to have a refresher for all of us on the difference between a standing committee and an ad hoc committee and how long council member committees should exist and what their purposes are. <laughs> so who on staff would like to give us a little 101 on committees? I will, I will start. <laughs> we may, um, may turn to either the city manager or city attorney for additional information. Um, typically, standing subcommittees are subcommittees that have a long-term charge. Um, as an example, uh, the city council has the standing committee of community grant funding, which is done annually, um, and so that is a standing committee. Uh, the other committees listed here are ad hoc subcommittees. And ad hoc subcommittees are, um, how do, let's see, <laughs> I apologize. So ad hoc subcommittees are for a more specified charge. And once that charge is completed, they are considered to be um, inactive, completed, and therefore disband. Um, the ones listed here, um, as an example, looking at anti-displacement strategy subcommittee that has been um, combined with the, uh, I believe the housing element. And so that charge is completed. So therefore it is being requested to be disbanded. So the list that you have here that say inactive uh, city council subcommittees, uh, those have completed their charges and are being uh, requested to be disbanded. Um, and again, that's kind of just very high level of the difference between a standing and an ad hoc subcommittee. And of course, I, I open it to our city manager, or city attorney for any further uh, clarification that could be provided. Uh, through, through the mayor, just for the <clears throat> benefit of the public, one other refresher would be that a standing committee is a Brown Act subject to um, open open meetings, noticing, whereas an ad hoc subcommittee uh, is not. Thank you, City Manager. So um, following up on Ms. Michelle's comment, um, and I'm just pulling this out of thin air. If the council, if two members, if the council wanted to kind of keep an eye on the housing element and how things were progressing, is that, would that be a type of appropriate committee? And if so, would that be a standing committee or an ad hoc committee, or is that inappropriate for the council to kind of hover over staff and, and see what you're up to? Uh, let's see, I always appreciate the opportunities to work with city council on, on various topics. So I think it's a matter of whether, and again, happy to have the city attorney chime in on some of this, but there's a difference between, uh, um, two city council members deciding to uh, Brown Act or, or, or um, team up to uh, 
dive deeper into a cert, certain topic that that can happen regardless of whether it's a subcommittee formation or not. So I think the important thing from a subcommittee formation is that it's um, definitely established by the council. The council's kind of uh, as a body is saying that they they do want, um, especially with an ad hoc subcommittee, uh, two council members to kind of uh, focus on that. Uh, uh, tap staff resources as part of that and then report back to the full council. And so that's where it's, I'd say it's the, the timeline or time frame of that. Uh, I think the anti-displacement example from the December time frame was perfect. It, it was formed, two council members met, discussed, came back at the next meeting with recommendations for the full council. Uh, council, I think for the most part, um, <clears throat> generally you know, appreciated that that work. And shortly thereafter, that, that subcommittee was disbanded. So that's a, a great example of a subcommittee. There's other subcommittees related to a development agreement negotiation that may take multiple months to, to work through that. Um, but I'll say if there's a, a ad hoc subcommittee that has been um, working on something for multiple years, that's probably an indication that it's tending more as a standing subcommittee than an ad hoc subcommittee. Thank you for that um, interesting description. Um, I think council member door, do you have a question or comment? So um, I just wanted to kind of lay down for council and for the public of what we're trying to do here. And my housing element was just an example. I'm not proposing we create a housing element subcommittee, but um, I think it is members of the council can always ask questions of city staff, city staff definitely report back to the full council um, regularly. Um, so I, I'm comfortable, you know, kind of where we're at for the most part. Um, with that, unless anyone has any general subcommittee things, I think what we're going to do is start with the um, disbanding recommendations from staff. Um, so these are the ones that have the, well, in the staff report, they're red, but um, there they are. Okay, so what we'd like to do here starting off is just going one by one and confirming um, that these are indeed, um, I guess, dead. So, and they can re be removed from any list. Is that correct? Is that what you're looking for? Yes, um, that's the, the, but just because it's listed as potential disbanding doesn't mean that the council couldn't um, re revive it, but that's um, that's the intent. Thank you. And Vice Mayor Taylor, I see your hand raised. Thank you, Mayor Willison. Um, so just looking at the list, um, with the anti-displacement strategy subcommittee, I'm comfortable with it being disbanded, um, but there are some concerns I actually just brought up to the city attorney today. Um, but I guess at any rate, so that's that's the one committee. Um, the Bayfront Homeless Encampment, um, I actually discussed briefly with the city manager about having something that looks at homeless citywide. Um, and let's see, and then as far as the Willow Road um, over interchange, the, I think the work, I mean, the physical work has been done, but still the, I think the planting of the vegetation has not been. And those are my initial comments. Thank you, um, Vice Mayor Taylor. So I think um, we'll go one by one and I, your comments are noted. So the rail subcommittee, I believe the council made clear that everybody on council wants to know what's going on with rail. Um, and so I am, as being the only remaining member of that subcommittee, which I think maybe never met, um, we'll go ahead and disband it unless there's an objection. Okay. Um, Anti-displacement strategy subcommittee. Again, uh, Vice Mayor Taylor, I think that council members can at any time, you know, work with the city manager, even bring in a brown neck buddy to do so. But in terms of having a charge from the council on a specific um, purpose, um, it seems to me like we had a very narrow to do, which was to um, prioritize the anti-displacement strategies for the housing element. Um, and so of course there's ongoing concerns, um, but I think the specific charge there, in my opinion is, is completed. I'll ask my other colleagues if they're interested in there being 
a continuous subcommittee on that. Um, Vice Mayor Taylor, did you want to chime in? Yes, and and thank you, and and I agree. Um, and just the concerns for me are with the anti-displacement strategies is the implementation. So that's where my concerns are. Um, City Manager Murphy, do you have thoughts about what role a possible subcommittee would play in that development of these policies? Uh, let's see, I can start. I may need uh, assistance from others for the refresher of the um, housing element adopted um, program. So I'd say at the if if that's the realm that um, is being contemplated, uh, yeah, I, I could see as part of um, uh, the work on that effort that there may be. I'm not sure. We could say this this evening that there would be. So I think it's a matter of we may need to look into that a little bit more. I think we're we're e eagerly awaiting the response from the state about the uh, overall housing element, uh, and we should know in the next week or so, because I think that may dictate um, uh, how we're going to be uh, focusing on some of these things. So on on that one, I'm not sure I could say this evening that there would be um, yeah. the need for that subcommittee, but I think we could definitely have that on a list for um, uh, a future subcommittee. In thinking about that one in particular, this one also makes me feel like we all want to track what's going on with anti-displacement. I mean, I know Council Member Combs has expressed um, some thoughts about it. Um, so to me, I think the problem that might be trying to be solved is just check-ins with Council and updates. Um, so I feel like this is one that should have daylight for all Council members. Um, that's where I'm leaning. Um, Vice Mayor Taylor um, is uh, asking my colleagues what they think about that. Uh, Council Member Doerr. Oh, um, just reflecting on our recent priorities dialogue, uh, this one seems to fall nicely under our uh, city priority of, our, of housing. And so um, just making the connecting point there. Uh, yes, I'm excited to continue following what's happening with anti-displacement and would love those updates. So Vice Mayor Taylor, are you comfortable then if it stays as kind of a full council and not a specific subcommittee, but that we are kind of requesting uh, some daylight into progress being made on that? Yes, that's fine. Thank you very much. Okay, so then we can take that one off. Um, so the homeless encampment, similar situation that that had a specific charge I believe at a specific time where there was a multi-jurisdictional effort, I think that, yes, Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, and and you are correct. Um, so I'm comfortable with this um, subcommittee being disbanded. Um, however, there is a, there are citywide challenges around homelessness. So we can take the same approach we did with the last um, where all council would have eyes on it. I'm not sure if there is homeless encampments in all districts. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but I think it's important um, that this is an issue. It's linked to housing, of course, um, and health and safety. So I'd like to see something. Yeah, I, I agree. And your linkage, again, just as, as Council Member Doerr did with our priorities, makes a lot of sense. So just now that we have two of these, City Manager Murphy, that we basically said no subcommittee, but keep us in the loop. Do you have an idea of what that looks like on your end? I guess even the rail subcommittee is kind of like that too, keeping us all in the loop on rail issues. Uh, let's see. Um, I, I think that at a certain level, the um, as uh, Council Member Door uh, reminded us all about the recent uh, Council priority setting, anything that kind of um, fits within that, given the um, work plans that we'll be working on and uh, the uh, reporting that we'll be doing, that 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 fits well. So I think that thus far we have. Um, uh, two things specifically to housing back, back to rail. There's going to be, there's multiple things that are rail related that are going to be on the council's agendas in the coming months. So I think we have opportunities for check-ins and if there's 
questions from the council about where something's at, the uh, council members can reach out to me and then we can um, figure out ways of uh, providing those updates. Fabulous, thank you. Um, we're now going on to the Facebook Willow Village Development Agreement. I believe that's already been negotiated. So I think we're ready to take that one off the list. Uh, Council Member Door. Never mind. Um, West Menlo Annexation, Council Member Door. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so thinking about this one, uh, the annexation application is still pending. I believe none of us were on City Council when this came up. Um, and I would like to propose keeping a subcommittee or making a, a mini subcommittee uh, to explore specifically um, the fee waiver aspect of uh, what it would mean to uh, address or look into this annexation. Um, it's something I discussed briefly with the city manager uh, previously uh, is specifically looking at that um, and was reassured that uh, a small assessment of that fee waiver uh, would not take up too much staff time and would be interesting to know uh, what that would look like. And so I would propose, um, and I would of course be on this, uh, I would put myself down as the first member um, and yes, would like to make that proposal. And I'd also like to check uh, about um, if and how many um, other uh, city council members would need to be on that subcommittee to to keep it uh, in uh, to keep it active. Thank you. So, um, City Manager Murphy, if we retain or want to go forward with a Willow Menlo Triangle Annexation Subcommittee, are we then off? If the council agrees with Council Member Door and says you get resources, you get staff time to do this, how much time and resources? are we authorizing? Because I think it's one thing if it's like a conversation about fee waiver, it's another thing if it's like a rabbit hole that's sucking up a lot of staff time and, and derailing from other priorities. So can you elaborate on that? Uh, yes, so uh, definitely attempting to avoid, avoid rabbit holes. Um, so um, I think uh, because so much time has passed since the initial application, everything, um, there's a certain uh, requirements that I think the, the city has in terms of processing the application and in terms of my refreshing of uh, this this issue, I think it boils down to um, this topic of the fee waiver. So that was part of the conversation that I had with the um, council member door. So if it's a matter of um, spending time with a council member or two just to kind of get the, the refresh of previous staff reports on this topic and um, understanding the extent of the fee waiver for processing the request. Um, it, it would be a um, uh, limited amount of um, staff time. I'm not sure if you want to say it in terms of hours. Um, yes, it, it, to me, it would be, um, I, I think I'm, I'm the main person with the continuity of the uh, um, previous history on this. And so it'd be a, a, probably a, a couple meetings um, with the council member and um, a few hours of research refresher on my time. And then it's kind of a matter of like reporting back to the full council. Council member Combs. Yeah, just so I can understand the, 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 um, it says annexation application is still pending. That's pending with the city or and so then the city has to do something because I thought that the county was the main blocker here. Is, is it? Is it not? Uh, let's see. So a part part of this is keep keeping uh, trying to the balancing act of providing enough information about this topic so that the council can decide whether or not to have a subcommittee versus get, getting into the topic. Otherwise, we're into the topic. So um, <clears throat> the um, annexation requires. Um, processing on the city side, but also the LAFCO Local Area Formation Commission. There's a work on the city side in the county in terms of um, property tax sharing agreements, uh, inventory of um, uh, infrastructure. And that's where I'd say there's been uh, progress in, in, over the years. That's the, the one benefit of uh, some time. So 
the main thing with infrastructure is that the county has been successful in getting a grant for uh, redoing Alameda de las Pulgas and as part of that addressing some of the pedestrian deficiencies so that that is something that is uh, different from the from the past there's other um research that need to be finalized on the uh, other two streets that form the triangle so that's the infrastructure side another part is the uh, zoning the, the area would need to be kind of pre-zoned um and if it's a matter of uh taking an existing zoning district in the city, such as R1U and saying that that is what applies to the new new parcels as opposed to a new custom zoning district, that kind of simplifies things. So there's a, a number of things that need to be done that are both the city obligation and um, a county obligation, uh, but to kind of do that processing, the city does have a fee associated with processing that to pretty much pay for staff time on that. The um, Property owners that submitted the petition for the annexation did collect money, did did um, contribute um, thousands of dollars towards that. That's been expended, ex expended, and then the city uh, was processing it through a, a fee waiver, and then then things kind of stopped. So if we're going to start back up again on the processing, that that to me, as I've gotten myself back up to speed on this, I think is the key kind of critical issue for the city council to weigh in on is whether or not to the time spent processing, whether that's uh, some sort of fee waiver, fee reduction, or if the applicants are paying the full full freight on that going forward. So, so and I, I know I'm trying not to get into this, but just wanting to understand they did pay some money to the city, right? And that was all exhausted. Correct. Yep. Do, how much money was that? I, I I I hesitate on some things, but let's just say for discussion purposes, let's say like five thousand dollars. And and how much of what's the dollar value in a ballpark of the work that's still to be done? Do we? I, that's where I'd hesitate. <laughs> I'd, I'm okay, kind of saying that rough number, but I'd I'd hes hesitate to say anything right now. But that that's part of what um, I think does require these. Uh, X hours of staff time to be able to come back um, with with that. I, I mean, I'll, I'll just say, in in theory, I'm supportive of of the idea. I, I don't know if it's a subcommittee or what of exploring this or, or sort of restarting it. But I, I think my suggestion, uh, Councilmember Door, is is that um, you should connect with, and maybe you already have. Supervisor Mueller and 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 there should be some understanding there of like because I know that this infrastructure element is key to uh, a lot of the unincorporated pockets around the city that make more sense in the city, but it's not that simple because while I'm supportive of this, I I want to would I would want to make sure that there's an aligning of the politicals and that, that there is some one in the county side that's willing to invest the time and effort of what may be needed to make sure that like once we get through all the processing on the city side, that there's actually going to be something that allows us to, to move forward. I mean, that's my only concern, but I, I mean, I, I, I'm, you know, if there's a sense of where the council majority wants to go here, I'm supportive. And I, like I said, I would be supportive of, of, of the request. Um, I been watching city council meetings for like seven years and I've seen that those folks come so many times to council Right now, our city manager is like almost, I mean, thank goodness, Stephen, uh, Mr. Stolte is here and Ms. Mello and, you know, he's staffing up. But um, if this is going through city manager Murphy with everything else on the plate and kind of looking at our strategic priorities and um, how challenging it can be to bring an item on the agenda related to housing or safe streets or what have you. Um, I feel like until the organization is um, built back um, and he has his full team, I'm not comfortable. Um, but I encourage you, Council Member Dorda, I think the folks that live in the Triangle have a lot of historical information. And I'm sure City Manager Murphy would be happy to share with you some documents as of yesteryear. And there might be conversations, as Council Member Combs said, with folks in the county that can be pursued. So there's a lot can be pursued just um, not in the subcommittee framework, but I just think with everything we have going on, I, I can't support it at this time. 
and I don't know where, but I would just have it like links into which it is and from I would welcome the opportunity to work with you on this or to, to support you in, in, in these efforts as, as like a sort of not, maybe you don't want but as, a, as an informal um, sort of Brown Act, um, because I, I think I think it is a real, real, real interesting topic. And I think we've all seen um, the, these, um, I would have given up by now, I'm very honest, like being in Menlo Park would not have been worth it <laughs> for me for as much time and effort that they have put into this. And so I, I certainly want to be responsive and that maybe, and I, I think as city manager Murphy and I have had this discussion, like to establish some sort of framework or rubric for how we then can look at like some of these other possible annexations. Um, but, but yeah, I think I am supportive. I do think the mayor's concern is, is, is valid. Um, that if, if the city attorney, excuse me, the city manager is, is working on this, it's, it's sort of like, um, like, um, that, that, that's a high hourly rate for maybe work that, <laughs> and doesn't really deserve it at this moment in time. Um, Councilmember Nash or Vice Mayor Ted, we have a lot more committees to get to. I know we're being trying to be very sympathetic to Councilmember Door, and we all, of course, want to say yes. Or, yeah. Councilmember Nash? What? Just very, very briefly, I agree with what's been said. I am very sympathetic, and the residents there have been tremendously. Um, strong advocates for many, many, many years. I also think there's some, um, it makes some sense for the city itself. Um, I think we have absolutely no bandwidth for it at this time. And I would actually go further than saying, I um, don't, I would like to keep it on the back burner, but um, I'm concerned not just about um, city manager Murphy's time, but also staff times generally. Um, just with all the priorities we have, all the needs our residents have expressed that we don't even have on the priority list and everything to me to try and add additional residents um, and go through that hoop. Um, I think we need to take care of our current residents first. Yes, and I appreciate that and uh, deeply echo those sentiments of wanting to focus on the priorities that we've said, focus on the work we have to do and we've said are our priorities. And so um, yeah, just know that that was uh, first in my mind as I asked uh, the city manager about uh, should this be explored more and should we maybe continue having a, a, uh, some kind of a ad hoc subcommittee to explore this, um, given the potential opportunity of uh, that also having more residents uh, would entail for the city. And so um, if, if this is where the city And potential comes, cost too. <laughs> and potential cost, yes, there's always that. Um, but I uh, am happy to continue exploring this uh, as the... Um, uh, as the kind of district representative up there. And uh, Council Member Combs would love to take you up on that and continuing the conversation. So it sounds like um, a Brown Act buddy, beautiful relationship will begin. And uh, we're going to take this off the list, though, as an official council subcommittee. Um, council Member, uh, Vice Mayor Taylor, are you comfortable with that? Okay, great. All right, we're now at the Willow Road 101 interchange. Um, so I believe this charge was what exactly city manager Murphy, cause I, I know there is still decisions or landscaping to be made, but are we at the, was it more community outreach? And now we're at the point where it's going to be coming to council for some kind of design decision. Uh, I'll probably need some, uh, assistance, uh, from others at, um, and that's part of the challenge I'll, I'd say going forward is for any uh, subcommittees that uh, are formed going forward, it'd be great if the um, charge kind of lives on the document with the, uh, with, with the subcommittee. But let me see if, um, yeah, so uh, the most recent uh, was uh, the subcommittee did was very helpful in the uh, direction that was provided for the landscaping to be pursued. Uh, the council as a whole then weighed in on that. And now it's a matter of actually executing on the, the design plans, working with Caltrans to, to ultimately um, get, the, um, get the project out to bid and um, landscaping installed. So the design has been, or, the design parameters, design um, parameters as, have been set. Uh, yeah, there was a specific council meeting where so uh, council, that was identified. So yep. council member Combs and vice mayor Taylor, what are your thoughts on this subcommittee disbanding? 
there we go. Um, y- yeah, I, I don't know exactly where we're at here. Again, at one point there was, there were two options, a sort of a really nice option and a not as nice option. And the, the city were, was exploring grants, um, to implement, um, to supplement the funding, to, put in the, the the really nice option and and I I know that uh, the vice mayor and I gave direction after the last grant was not granted um that we would just focus on uh landscaping that m- m- met the current funds allotted um and so um and so yeah I I, I don't know where we are I, I mean I I would be okay in theory with disbanding us I would like an informational item because I don't know where where this is other than than um yeah there certainly is there's no landscaping <laughs> that has been done um and and um and it would be great to understand exactly where where this is vice mayor taylor are you comfortable disbanding it and i mean i also love an info item on this <laughs> as well and yes okay great okay so we have disbanded all of these um, suggested disbandment. So now we're going to go back. Oh, Mayor Willison, yes. pardon the interruption. Can we um, take an action on the disbanding of these with a motion and a second? Is there a motion to disband the recommended inactive uh, subcommittees? Uh, Vice Mayor Taylor. I'll make the motion to disband the inactive subcommittees. Thank you. And uh, Vice uh, Councilmember Nash. I will second. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Taylor and a second by City Council Member Nash to disband inactive City Council subcommittees. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, City Council Member Combs? Yes. City Council Member Doer? Yes. City Council Member Nash? Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mayor Willison? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to go back to the top of the list, and we're going to start with our one and only standing subcommittee, which I believe meets like once or twice at the end of the year. Um, basically, it's like a Santa experience where you give out money. Um, so um, we still need to give out money. Um, and is anyone wanting to get off? Is anyone wanting to get on? Um, yeah, so like one of uh, we gave um, some direction in connection with the last psycho and it was about sort of marketing and advertising um, and and um, and so as long as that I I think I've been on this since I've been on council, I enjoy it. It has been um, giving away money. But if there is someone else who desires to be on it, I'm also willing to, you know, give give them that opportunity. Um, so, uh, and I would say it would be me because I think I've, I've been on it longer than, than, than uh, the vice mayor, um, if there is someone to transition off of it. Um, and vice mayor Taylor, are you interested in staying on it as well? I'm fine staying on. Okay. Uh, council member door, did you want to, um, would be happy to support with that, but also don't want to take over something that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, uh, I have no problems, but only if you want to do it, like, right? If 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 it is something you're interested in doing, then I I certainly am cool with uh with, with letting you transition in. Okay, thank you. I would love to do that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we're taking fun away from Council Member Combs and giving it to Council Member Door. Um, I have noticed one comment while we're. Oh, I guess that would be off agenda. Never mind. I do notice that the budget goes up every year from the allocated budget, but maybe we'll talk about that during the budget. That is all, Vice Mayor Taylor. Okay. All Vice Mayor Taylor. Okay. Um, so we are now moving on to aquatics operator negotiation subcommittee. This is a new subcommittee that we just created to negotiate with team Sheeper. Um, so it seems like it has a very specific charge, which is a good thing. And we just recently appointed council member Nash and vice mayor Taylor. So, uh, vice mayor Taylor. I hope this is staying on the list. I don't think we're getting rid of this one, but are you happy to stay on it? Yes. And council member Nash, fabulous. Okay. Um, Now we're going to the climate action. Okay. This is kind of confusing because the um, climate action tasks are numbered and we kind of bifurcated them. 
Um, I'm on, but uh, council member Nash is on all of the climate action plan subcommittees. I'm on numbers one through five, but I've really only been working on electrification. Um, and council member Nash has been working on um, resilience, I believe, or sea level rise. Um, so, um, and I know probably council member Dora wants to get in on some action too. And council member Combs has no interest. So that's fabulous. Okay. So any comments, suggestions, thoughts about, I'm going to do both of these at once because we might want to talk about them as a group count of Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, uh, Mayor Willison. And I remember when the number six subcommittee was created and uh, was out of my request regarding the sea level rise, um, especially with safer, um, all the projects that are happening on Bayfront. I am very comfortable keeping this subcommittee and staying on it. Great. Um, in terms of my role, so we're going to be, um, we're, we're working on electrification right now. So I'd like to stay on electrification, um, which is, is that number one or number three? Okay, one. I can never remember what all the different references. Um, uh, so that's my position, at least for now, I could see rolling off it at some point. Um, you know, at, once we solve all of climate change and electrification. Um, Council Member Nash, I'd like to hear your thoughts on these, and then we'll go to Council Member Dor to see what she wants to do get out for. I think I um, probably feel the same as you. I feel like I'd like to continue. I think it's just another month or two for electrification. Um, I am interested in being on the subcommittee, but I also um, want to give Council Member Dor an opportunity. So I, I can, I am flexible. Um, I'd love to hear from Council Member Dor. Thank you, and uh, I, I appreciate the the opportunity to to join in and support the climate action work of our city. Um, I, uh, so I uh, Council Member Nash, I'm wondering if there's one of the one e either one that um, would make more sense because I, I feel agnostic towards jumping on either one, and I want to make sure there's good continuity in the work that you've already been leading there. And especially with also your role on PCE, I think there's some important connections there, but there are also important connections with uh, number six. And so I I'd appreciate your your thoughts. Thank you, uh, council member Dor. I see vice mayor Taylor's hand back up. I forgot to put it down, Mayor Willison. Great, uh, council member Nash, you are being asked to pick something. I am good any which way. Um, I am able to work on climate action through both um, as the EQC liaison and on PCE as the board member. Um, I am. Can I follow up fine. Council Member Nash? Sure. Does PCE do a lot of uh, climate action number six work? They do not. I mean, so I don't want to say what to do, but. That is fine. Okay. So I will stay on one through five and um, yes, it's totally fine. It's um, that is fine. Yes. So you will. So we'll, we'll revisit this again. So this isn't forever and ever, but it sounds like we're, if uh, everyone's comfortable, it looks like we're heading towards council member Nash coming off number six and being replaced with council member door. Thank you. Okay, um, remember that's, that doesn't mean whoever isn't on the subcommittee doesn't care about an item or can't talk to staff about an item or work on an item. Okay, economic development subcommittee ad hoc. So this was council member Nash and uh, former council member Mueller. Um, I was always confused with the charge of this. I'm sorry, we missed the Connect Menlo Community Amenities Subcommittee. Is that done or are you still discussing community amenities? So we are hoping to wrap it up very, very soon um, in the spring, hopefully the springtime, and then um, have it come to council and be done. Basically, it is um, waiting for our um, very overworked staff to have some time to do that, which um, the housing element has been a priority over this. 
So question for staff then, um, if we know kind of a trigger is coming to disband the committee, can you then do that when that happens? Or do we have to have like another resolution or vote at that time? Yes, but no, that, that, that I think the connect as um, <clears throat> council member uh, Nash spoke to, yes, there's uh, I think one one remaining step uh, for for that subcommittee's work. It's, it is dependent on staff bringing it forward. So when that, comes forward as part of that action, um, as long as we've achieved that conclusion, then the subcommittee could be disbanded that same night. And then um, that that would uh, keep things fresh and, and clear for people going forward. Yes, exactly, yeah. And I just want to acknowledge how much work staff has done on it and how much is left to do before it can be brought forward. And so then just piggybacking on that with the aquatics operator agreement. So once something is negotiated, the same thing could potentially happen. Okay. Yes. So just for uh, those that can't see my head nodding. Yes. yes. So I, I hate to go back to the climate action ones, but I am a little confused on exactly what the charge of those committees are, the, these being ad hoc subcommittees. Is that something, we don't have to resolve that tonight, but that might be something that those committee members should work with staff on defining if that's the direction we want to go on. Because I'm not clear like when does sea level rise end <laughs> as a subcommittee. It's so, like, what's the task that that was created for and how will we know when it's over? Okay. Um, economic development subcommittee, great example. Um, I've always been confused by the charge of the subcommittee. Council member Nash, what's your charge? So um, council member Mueller and I possibly met once. We really, this committee never really, subcommittee never really got off the ground um, the year that, or however long it was that I was on it. Um, I don't know. I would actually look to city manager, Murphy to see whether it would be helpful. I think it's, I mean, very honestly, um, I have a tremendous interest in it, um, but it never really, we never really did much with it. And I don't know if that's something that would be helpful to staff or not at this point, given that we're without an economic development. This one reminds sure. me a lot of the one, the, the ones we were um, talking about, lots of council members wanting to know about. Um, I would propose we not have this as a subcommittee. I, I believe the mayor um, is the liaison with the Chamber of Commerce, and this is one of our prior strategic priorities. And so I would imagine this is going to be involving all council members. I see council member Combs. Yeah, there wasn't there also like a downtown subcommittee. Did that go away or did that get combined into this? I can't. Council Member Mueller and I were, um, I think we were just brown acted on the downtown. Oh, uh, okay. Um, I don't think that we specifically had okay. yeah, a I'm... subcommittee. And I think that it's actually a very good idea to um, have this some, dissolve and just be part of the entire council. I see Vice Mayor Taylor with her hand raised. Thank you, Mayor Willis. And I, I was actually just going to ask the same question that Council Member Combs um, brought up. And then also during our priority setting, we added downtown. I forget, there were two pieces of downtown. I think one was economic, yes. had to do with economic development. So, yeah. Um, so there's opportunity, um, Council Member Nash. Lots of opportunity. So yes. I think um, the staff has direction then that this is a full council topic. And as I, if I learn anything in the chamber stuff, um, which I'm actually meeting with, I'll do a council member update this week. But um, anyway, okay. So Menlo Park Community Campus subcommittee, I believe that's a very active subcommittee with a very specific charge. So uh, I believe Vice Mayor Taylor and Council Member Nash are deep in their work, so it seems like it would be disruptive to change the makeup of that committee. Okay, I'm seeing nods, Council Member. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that stays as is. Reimagining Public Safety Subcommittee. So, um, Vice Mayor Taylor, do you want to comment on this subcommittee? I believe isn't there an info item on? 
So we do have an info item. Thank you for the, the marketing of that. Um, so the charge of this subcommittee, I might be making it up now retroactively, but it was to build trust with our new police chief to um, hold listening to kind of understand community concerns related to policing and kind of come up with next steps um, for the department on where to go from here. And so with the submittal of the staff report that our chief kindly put together that outlines quite a few next steps, um, this might be one of those things where um, we continue, council member, uh, Vice Mayor Taylor and I continue to care about and you know, maybe as a Brown Act, talk to the chief as needed. But I think that our specific charge um, might be wrapping up. I don't know if we've reimagined public safety, but um, that's a, quite a large task for an ad hoc subcommittee. Um, Vice Mayor Taylor, what are your thoughts? I agree with you, Mayor Willison. And I also look at the number of subcommittees and it's a, a list. Um, I know that, if I'm not mistaken, Chief Norris wanted to continue it, or maybe I misunderstood. So I'm not sure if we're ready at this time to actually disband it, but I will look to your direction so, uh, or the city managers. Norris is in chambers and is walking to the table. And so Chief Norris, the question for you is, are we ready to disband? And if not, what's our trigger to disband? I, I can tell you, uh, Mayor and Vice Mayor, uh, extraordinarily appreciative of the work that we've done uh, over the last, I think, year and a half or so uh, that we've been working in the subcommittee. I'm, I'm certainly interested in continuing the work that we have started and the momentum that we have with, uh, with what we've established through the subcommittee. But just if, if I'm doing a kind of a, a snap judgment on where we are in terms of the, the, the overall life of the ad hoc subcommittee itself, um, I think it has somewhat served its purpose. I would certainly lean back on the two of you to say whether or not you feel like the purpose has been served in establishing the relationship with the police chief and understanding the direction of the police department and where we're going, which I think was really what we were trying to do with that subcommittee and, and essentially catch up with some of the, the, uh, the dialogue that was kind of put on pause during the time of the interim police chief before my, my, I filled that position. And so, you know, my feeling is that we are in the right place with the right momentum. Um, you certainly have a commitment from me that that momentum will continue. Um, and so I, I leave it up to the two of you to discuss and decide whether, whether you feel like this is a good time for us to sunset the ad hoc committee itself and continue the momentum. Thank you, Chief Norris. Um... So I, I agree. Um, I think this is a topic of wide council interest. Um, and I, if we continue, I just think it could be potentially never ending. And so I think as issues come up, as you pursue the different items in your um, plan, please keep us in the loop, come to council, um, reach out to any of us at any time. I'm sure we'll, we're gonna continue to be close and, and talk. Um, uh, but I see that council member Nash has something to say. I just want to thank the subcommittee as well as, uh, the chief. And I know that, um, city manager has been working hard with them. Um, I know that you have had many, many, many meetings, I believe in the report, it says 64. Um, and I greatly appreciate all the work you've done on this and really doing a deep dive into it. Thank you. Okay, then if there is consensus, is there any objection then to disbanding the Reimagining Public Safety Subcommittee? Not seeing any, okay. So um, uh, Ms. Heron, do you want us to do any, do we need to do anything with the these before we move on to the next category? 
um, if we are going to be uh, appointing to the potential ad hoc subcommittees, we can just encompass that with okay, one great, motion. Great. Okay. So um, the first suggested ad hoc subcommittee would be to negotiate the development agreement on Commonwealth three. I see Vice Mayor Taylor's hand raised. Thank you, Mayor Wilson. I would be interested in serving on this subcommittee. Okay, and I see Council Member Nash's hand raised. I would also be interested in working on it. It sort of furthers our what we're doing with the community amenities um, in Bayfront, but happy to consider if anyone else is interested. I don't see anyone fighting you for it, so congratulations. Um, we're now going on to Parkline. This is one that I would very much like to be on, but it's in the middle of my district. Um, and I am looking at the list and seeing two names that aren't, well, actually one name that might not be represented at all, um, and one name that's slightly represented. So I'm looking to uh, Council Member Dorn, Council Member Nash, if anyone wants to join me, sorry, and Council Member Combs, I was looking at him, um, working with Parkline. Um, on the development agreement negotiations. Yeah, I'm I'm fine with serving on the subcommittee. Okay. Uh, um, but if Councilmember Dorr wants to, I'm more than happy to to defer. That's that's the only thing I'll say. But I I'm de totally cool, cool to do it. Councilmember Dorr. Um, that that sounds great. Thank you. I think given the the takeaway of your fun holiday grant making, this will make up for it. Okay. So council member Combs and I will be on the park line um, development agreement subcommittee. Wonderful. Okay. So then I believe we need to do some kind of motion codifying. Oh, vice mayor Taylor, please. Thank you, Mayor Wilson. I'll make a motion to approve all of the council's discussion to disband and the new creation of subcommittees. Does that work? I think we already disbanded in a motion. So why don't you just uh, uh, I'm banned. So uh, city Clerk Heron, can you help me out? It'll be to make appointments to city council standing and ad hoc uh, standing or subcommittees. I'll make a motion to appoint the city council subcommittee. That's perfect. Thank you. And I would second that motion. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Taylor and a second by City Council Member Doer to make appointments to the City Council Standing and Ad Hoc Subcommittees. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, City Council Member Combs? Yes. City Council Member Doer? Yes. City Council Member Nash? Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mayor Willison? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. And now... We are actually moving on to our informational items. Is that right, City Clerk Karen? Yes. Okay, and thank you. Um, informational items are transmitted to the City Council in staff's effort to provide an update on matters of importance to the City Council. Informational items are not action items. However, a City Council member, City staff member, or a member of the public may request to make a comment or ask a question on any of the informational items. So City Clerk Karen, do we have any public any public comments on the informational items? Thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on our informational items, H1, City Council agenda topics, H2, an update on the emergency water storage supply project, H3, the annual City Council priority and goal setting workshop update, H4, reimagining public safety ad hoc subcommittee update, H5, the RIPA data annual report for calendar year 2022, or H6, the California Public Records Act internal procedures. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, press star nine. For those of you in person, please feel free to complete a speaker card and return it to the clerk's desk. And our first speaker will be Adina Levin. Good evening, Mayor, Council members, and staff. Uh, I'm glad to see the city council prioritization. I'm working its way through the city planning process. The two items that I wanted to uh, make public comment about are about the um, the reimagining public safety and the uh, RIPA data. 
um, on the reimagining public safety. I'm glad to see that Menlo Park has put in to participate in the county mental health uh, program. Um, given that the county focuses on mental health, that seems like a good fit. Um, in terms of the um, the proposal for an advisory body, um, it does seem that given the importance of the topic and um, the importance of community participation and um, that having a, a commission um, does seem like a fair thing to do. We have commissions for environmental quality, we have commissions for uh, complete streets. This does seem like a substantive topic that would uh, merit a, a Brown Act mission. Um, and um, on uh, and uh, like for for, for an, an example, um, the on the RIPA topic, it is um, glad to see this uh, data that's required by state law um, being published and being available to view. And um, one of the uh, pieces of information that is um, seem kind of striking in looking at the numbers is in terms of the stops by ethnicity. Um, it says that the share of people that are stopped by police who are Hispanic or Latino or identified as such um, by our, is 39.9%, um, whereas the population of uh, Hispanic or Latino people in Menlo Park residents is 15.5%. And the population in San Mateo County as a whole is about 25%. So that does seem like a significantly higher share of uh, Hispanic and Latino people being stopped by police than the share uh, in the city or the county. And that does uh, you know, raise questions as to uh, why that might be. And it seems like um, uh, the uh, looking into why seems like an important topic. Um, also, the there is not information about where those stops are occurring, and that is also important information to know. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. This will be the final call for public comment on our informational items. Okay, and I see Pam Jones. Pam, if you could let us know what item you're speaking on as well. Uh, yes, thank you on the uh, the last two, and I don't have their their code. That's quite all right, I got those things. Yeah. Um, and, and I just had just more like suggestions, and and that is uh, first of all, I want to say thank you. Um, these reports have been so long overdue, and um, uh, it just really helps me to have a lot of hope for the future as we you know, move forward. Uh, I'd like to see with the, to have a transparent advisory group, however that works best. And I'm not, I don't, don't know what that one will be, but I just think it needs to be really transparent. And the second thing with the RIPA uh, data, um, again, thank you for that one, because I remember asking for it many times and it wasn't, um, that information wasn't given until it was required by the state, but I know you were working on it regardless of that. So, um, but my uh, uh, suggestion on the report is that the next time one is done, is it to include an analysis so that we can better understand uh, what what the data is really telling us and, and then it'll make it simpler for us to, to see any trends. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Okay, I am seeing no further hands or cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, Ms. Heron. So um, these are informational items and no action um, is or will be taken. I did wanna allow um, our ch police chief, um, Dave Norris, an opportunity. Um, I know that the RIPA data sometimes raises more questions than answers. And so um, what steps 
does the department plan on taking? Um, I know that kind of being curious, being open to digging and, and finding out and how is that gonna process gonna unfold and how is the community going to be involved? Um, and then thoughts about the advisory commission. Uh, so first, uh, I really appreciate the questions that were brought up. Uh, I think they are, they all represent some important pieces and important questions here that we're, that we're talking about. Um, I, I want to try and take them somewhat, somewhat in order. And I think the, one of the first questions I, and I appreciate um, Ms. Levin's comment about us, you know, pursuing some type of, uh, some type of mental health response, mental health related response. And we're going to continue to, to focus on that and, you know, whether we get this money from the county or whether we find another creative way, we're, we're committed to figuring out an alternative for that, um, that, uh, that suits both our officers on the street and, uh, and the folks that are in need of help. Um, the, uh, in, in terms of the, the race ethnicity breakdown that is in the RIPA data, and I'll just take a quick step back from that because I know um, Ms. Jones was asking about, you know, adding some analysis. And I want to be very clear about why we did not add analysis into this report. Um, I felt that it was very important that you see the data and then you being the public, see the data as the data without any interpretation coming from the police department or any sense of editorialization that was coming from PD. Um, we wanted you to see that as, as close to raw data as, as you could get it. And that's why it's presented in the form that it's in. Um, that said, you know, we have looked at a couple of things and, you know, yes, we noticed that if you look directly at the, the local city demographics and you lay that up against our RIPA data, uh, there are some marked differences between those two things. Um, anything like that is a place for us to dig in with our curiosity and try and see if there are some lessons learned and some things to be determined from that. And so we're certainly going to be looking into that and seeing if there are some lessons learned or some or some or something about that data that will inform how we police. Um, but I will also say kind of to balance that, we just received uh, recently the report from the, the RIPA board, the state board uh, that analyzes, they, they take it uh, a year at a time. And so their 2023 report that they just published actually analyzes 2021 data so that's not Menlo Park PD reported data, right? That's the year before we reported, but they analyzed 3.1 million stops and within a percentage point or three, um, we are, our, our race ethnicity breakdown for the, for the stops that are being done in Menlo Park are almost identical to the 3.1 million stops that are being done statewide. So there may be trends that are much broader policing trends, statewide trends that we have to look at as well. So we're going to be we're going to be looking at all of that as we examine that. And one of the things that I know Ms. Levin brought up the idea of of comparing the stop data broken down by race ethnicity to the local demographics and even the county demographics and I appreciate um, because that's a very common approach that's been taken and so one of the things that I wanted to look at and it's research that's separate from the, from the RIPA data, but I think it's important research to bring up, is we looked at 27,000 traffic stops that we did over the past five years. 83% uh, of those traffic stops are, are made on people who are non-residents of Menlo Park. So only about 17% of the stops that we make are actually red Menlo Park residents. And so I think we just need to have a, a sense of balance and a sense of caution when we look at the, the breakdown because comparing it directly to our, uh, our our demographics locally here in Menlo Park, I think could potentially be an apples to oranges type comparison. So I think we wanna be very careful about how we look at that data. Um, and as a matter of fact, I'm having those discussions on a national level with with folks about how, how we best find a, a good set of comparative data to look at with our stop data because Stop data really is unique. It doesn't necessarily represent the entire population of the city. So, you know, those are things that we are going to be looking at. Um, with regard to the advisory group, uh, one of the conclusions that we came to in discussion uh, within our subcommittee that I think is an important place to start exploring is to start with 
uh, a non-Brown Act uh, advisory group that is transparent to Ms. Jones's point, uh, that is very transparent, that provides information back to the community about what we're looking into and what we're talking about and see if that is satisfactory to the, to the cause. Um, if it looks like that's, that's not heading in the direction or not providing the, the amount of, um, of analysis or review that we need as a city, then we should have a secondary conversation and, and see if there are other means that we could use to do that. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm fairly confident that you know, finding a good cross-section of our community and having them you know, actively participate in conversations about policing in this community, I think will be a really great start for us. And, uh, you know, my assurance to the council is that that will be uh, something that we'll be as transparent as possible with uh, with what we're talking about in those groups and any and any questions that are being asked and any, uh, and any opinions that are being rendered as part of that group. So we're looking forward to bringing that forward with you. Uh, the RIPA data itself will become an addendum to our quarterly reporting. Uh, we created the report that you saw submitted tonight as, as a template so that we can then turn around and quarterly, we could just add that to our quarterly report and provide you with uh, more frequent updates on that, on that data. Uh, the um, reporting requirement that we have is to give all of our data to DOJ by April 1st of the year after we collected that data. Uh, we actually do that on a monthly basis. And so we'll be able to put that put that data together, package it up, and now we have a nice template that we can bring back to you so that we can uh, explore some of these questions. So those those are the initial answers I have for you. I know that's just one council member asking questions, so I'll open it up to any other questions you might thank, have. Thank you. And just following up then, um, I really appreciate how you just gave us the data um, so that didn't, there was no story trying to be spun or anything. Um, will there be future conversations with the community about how to think about this, how the community might be approaching it? Um, are those? Yeah, essentially, yes. I, I think that that what we want to do is we want to, and keeping in mind that 2022 is the very first year that we have, uh, that we've put this data out. So this is really a baseline for us. And we've learned a ton. Uh, over this over this past year's data, and really so much more in the last couple of weeks, as we've been able to look at it with sort of a ten thousand foot view, if you will, looking at all of that data, all seven thousand uh, one hundred and some stops as a as a sum, and looking at you know are there some training issues with how we collect data so that we can make it more efficient, we can make it more accurate. Um, we're we're learning by leaps and bounds with this. So um, as we start to you know take this in smaller bites and, and can ask, you know, really good questions about it. There will be opportunities for us to have further discussions on that. Um, I just want to make sure that we're, that we're, we're being really thorough and methodical about our approach. Thank you, chief. Um, Vice Mayor Taylor, um, having been on the subcommittee with us, is there anything else you want to say? At, at the moment, uh, no, Vice Mayor Wilson. Thank you. Thank you. And um, real fast before I turn over to see if my colleagues have questions. Um, I just want to, again, thank Chief Norris. Um, I did 64 meetings was a lot. Um, and we went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth on a lot, like the advisory body versus, was a topic I think we discussed probably 63 times. Um, so um, this is, you know, this is a, a marathon. We want it to be a sprint. We want to be as great as we can, as quickly as we can. Um, but this is real work that's being done. And so we have to be really thoughtful about it. So thank you for being part of that journey with us, Chief Norris. Um, Council Member Nash or Council Member Dorr, any comments, questions about any of the info items, or particularly policing? Okay. Uh, Council Member Dorr. Uh, yes, I, I just want to check on process because I know we we asked for public comment and there was a response to that. Um, can this be on any of the public comment items? Okay, great. Okay. Um, I really appreciate this report and seeing the transparency is really, really helpful. Um, some things on thinking about comparative data. Uh, I did a quick search and there's something called the Bay Area Equity Atlas and that shows the nine different counties and it shows the racial breakdown of communities and the comparison with Menlo Park, um, kind of echoing what um, one of our speakers, Adina Lovett, shared 
that also didn't look great in, in that comparison either. So even from the city, from the county, from the nine county area, those numbers don't look good. And I'm, I'm I guess, glad to hear that it's about, about the same as the state, but I think that there's so much more we can do. And um, I know that you are thinking deeply about how, how, uh, how these issues are showing up in our policing. And um, I appreciate the accountability that you're building with the community at, at whole. And I'm excited for those continued conversations. Um, and for me, it doesn't matter that 83% of those stops are not Menlo Park residents. They are, they are still neighbors in some sense or another. And um, thinking about how, how those things are connected is important. And another note, actually coming back to our conversation earlier about uh, strategies for safe streets, um, the data shows the time of day, it shows who, it shows what, um, it doesn't show where. And so something that I am thinking about is if the vast, vast majority of these stops are traffic related, um, those seems like uh, there seem like other opportunities there with public works to think about are there opportunities to within our public works create uh, systems so um, police time can be spent doing other things other than traffic stops. Um, so that's something I'm excited to hear and, and see more about as well. So uh, a couple of quick things to that. So um, if you notice, I actually hyperlinked in my report to that nine Bay Area County demographic spread. So I wanted I want us to be very open about, you know, how those things compare. And and we do need to, you know, find out what type of lessons there are to be learned from that. It may actually be related to, you know, multiple different pieces within this data as well. You know, we've we've seen some real trends in terms of time of day, days of the week uh, that we're making these stops. Um, and then I, you had a question about location and I know I believe it was um, a Dean 11 that asked the question about location also. So one of the things that we're working on is, you know, creating a dashboard that provides that information in, in a little bit more of an illustrative way. We already have an open data portal where you can actually pull all of that information much, much broader than our RIPA data and, and look at the locations of traffic stops plotted out over a period of time, um, working with, with uh, ArcGIS and with Loy, as well as uh, with, with Tracy Weber, who does our dispatch and records and, and pulls all of those things into our reporting systems to give a better illustration of what that looks like. Because those are things that I wanna explore also. What I wanna look at is, you know, what are we doing that are officer initiated activities versus um, calls for response. What do traffic stops look like compared to uh, uh, accident locations or, or crash locations rather uh, within the city? Um, these are things that, that we want to be able to bring to you and illustrate to you. And that's, that is an open and active project with us to try and bring you back a dashboard that's a lot easier to, to work with than just giving you an enormous lump sum of data and just saying, hey, figure it out. Um, we don't want to do that. We want to provide something that has a little bit more of a visual appeal to uh, to the community. Council Member Nash. So I just, I wanted to um, make a note on the H3, the annual city council priority and goal setting workshop. And just to um, highlight that organizational effectiveness is extremely important as well. I think all of us, if we had more dots would that would have gotten some votes as well. And just want to, um, highlight that that is um, something that hopefully we can do as along with some of the other priorities, just sort of in concert with it. Um, thank you. And then I wanted to um, have a call out to City Clerk Heron and the City Attorney's Office and the PRAs. I thought it was really helpful to see the, um, the Public Records Act internal procedures and also note how much staff time and work goes into it. It's It was illuminating. Thank you, Council Member Nash. Uh, Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Willison. And I, I just wanted to to follow up on a, on a question. Um, it was actually helpful just to listen to um, not just the public comments, but also um, city council members um, 
discuss the um, the information about the RIPA data and also the reimagining public safety because we have not reported out in quite some time. Um, for me, it was important to hear other folks thoughts and concerns um, as opposed to sharing mine. Um, the only question that has actually come up for me and this might be in the report and I just missed it, um, but is is it required um, through the RIPA data to share where the stops are since I've heard that come up three times. Um, and I'm sorry, Chief Norris, that I'm, I'm That's not there, but I'm actually asking you. Perfectly fine. And, and I appreciate the question. Um, it is actually not a required part of the RIPA data. And I, and, and I think that's because what the state is collecting um, is an objective set of data. And I think that if you had to drill down to each individual jurisdiction and try to uh, you know, analyze it uh, in terms of location data across each jurisdiction, you'd, you'd be way over your skis. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't collect that data. We do collect the locations of all of our stops. There's just not necessarily perfectly collated with that RIPA data itself. So we can still look at all the traffic stops, pedestrian stops, et cetera, and look at the locations and, and, and find where they are on the map. And typically, um, you know, you see in the RIPA data that everything kind of leans very traffic oriented, right? The, the high frequency of stops is the commute times, uh, uh, usually during weekdays. Um, and you, you see the same type of location data when it comes to traffic stops as well. Most of the commute corridors are where you see the majority of that of that stop data um, or the stop locations rather, as well as like downtown area, areas of high traffic and, and high frequency travel. So, um, but all of that is available and we're looking for ways to make that more visible to you, but it is not part of the RIPA data itself. Thank you. And is it is it possible just to include that in the next report? I, I think what I would like to do is I would love to bring you that data kind of separately because I would like to keep those two things uh, distinctly separate because one we're reporting to DOJ and one is data that we collect here. Um, but happy to bring both of those things forward in, you know, either in a quarterly report or if you were looking for it as an informational item to just uh, discuss kind of what the what the general uh, geographic spread is of our of our stops. Happy to do something along those lines. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you, Chief. And, and Mayor Willison, are we still on informational items? We are. Okay, um, so I, I had a comment about um, actually H3, and I just realized that Councilmember Combs isn't here. Um, so I will, I'll bring this up now and then bring it up at our next meeting. Um, but I'm actually hoping um, that through the council priorities that, well, um, my request is that we look at the norms and and actually adopt them as a council, and um, and I'm not sure when that would happen, um, how that would happen, but that is one of my requests. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. I I've started keeping a whiteboard with kind of policies and procedure items, and in okay. big letters it says norms. So okay. those are things that City Manager Murphy and I, and maybe you can join into, um, kind of have uh, to discuss kind of literally as we get through the storms and everything. So um, thank you though for, for highlighting that. Anything else, Vice Mayor Taylor? On the informational items. And there was one part that I, I will bring up and I it is likely not to happen because um, today is March 28th, um, but the county is accepting um, grant applications for Measure K funds, and it is due on March 31st. Um, one is specific, at least the email I saw was specific to District 2 um, for the county, or it would have to be a citywide serve the city, I'm sorry, serve the county of San Mateo, um, but I'm just putting that out there. Um, because there was discussion about the um, mental health response and applying for a grant. Um, so at any rate, um, that was my last comment. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. So if there are no further comments or questions uh, on the informational items, we are now moving on to I, City Manager's report. So City Manager Murphy, how are you doing? Uh, uh, th thank you. Mayor, I'm doing doing great. Um, 
it's uh, uh, we do take uh, each uh, week or day at a time, and especially as uh, with storm forecasts. So I'm uh, uh, thankful that um, winds weren't as as high as projected, not as much rain as projected. So, but uh, we were were prepared. Um, um, but uh, thankful that um, uh, impacts aren't tremendous. But there are still indeed uh, impacts. You know, learned of another. Um, tree down impacting a, a house so there's um you know some some people that are impacted by that uh tonight there was some uh, very minimal power outages today so there's still still um real real impacts that come come from uh, what we're experiencing but uh thankful it's not not to the extent that we've experienced over the previous storms so the the two things um, I'd like to just notice is the um, that next week's uh, council meeting on um, April fourth will be located at the Bellhaven Branch Library. So it will be a in person meeting with um, remote participation from the public possible. Um, uh, uh, we do believe that we're we've we've run some other uh, commission meetings from that location. So we. Um, I think we've got the uh, technology uh, down for that, um, and we'll we'll be testing it out the day of and everything. Make sure we're ready to go. But we're excited about being able to um, uh, hold a council meeting in the Bellhaven neighborhood. It's been a tradition over the years, so we're we're happy to be able to do that again this year. And uh, the second thing is just a, an announcement that we do have a request for proposal out for. Um, services related to our uh, administration of our below market rate housing program and so that was um, launched a, a few days ago and is open for the next couple of weeks and so we're uh, looking forward to uh, getting proposals for that that service and that's it for tonight Thank you, City Manager Murphy. Um, just following up on that last RFP report, is House Keys currently our BMR provider? Yes, House Keys is the current provider, and they could uh, compete for the um, for the proposal. Uh, but we did kind of uh, issue a new RF RFP to 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 see what the uh, marketplace has. Okay, thank you. Um, now we are on J, which is city council member reports. Um, any city council member reports? Uh, council member door. Yes. Uh, Bosca, the Bay area water supply and conservation agency, uh, had our, uh, meeting on March 16th. Um, where we talked about our water resources and we had the good news from Governor Newsom that uh, with all this rain, we are able to ease drought restrictions some, which is great news for our uh, reservoirs and for communities. Um, but that still just means that uh, the reservoirs are expected to deliver 75% of requested water supplies. So part of our state is still in a drought, which kind of signals just how bad the drought had been. And um, so the, and also the, the little blessing of the water is that um, it, it is helping our state. And that's all. Thank you. I see Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Willison. Um, my report out is that the SBW May meeting retreat that was supposed to happen on March 23rd was actually canceled. Um, canceled due to the power outages. We were supposed to have the retreat at Kenyatta College. It looks like the next opportunity will be in May, hopefully, of this year. Um, I also have another, what's not a report out, it's actually a request. Um, and is that possible to do now, unless there's another um, sub, um, report out from a um, council member? This is a request to have an item agendized or, or this is a, yes. Um, I speak, speak freely, then we'll figure out what to do with what you're saying. Thank you. Um, and I believe we all, we all saw this email, um, it's an email from a commissioner, um, with a request, um, and the request is, um, to discuss that commissioners receive a stipend. Um, for their volunteer work. Um, I believe this falls under um, not just the category of 
of compensation, but also equity. So it would be great if we take up this discussion prior to budgeting, because I believe it's a budgeting issue um, and it wasn't necessarily a priorities issue, even though it's important to all of us. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Taylor. So I'm going to ask, I ask this every time someone wants to have a fun item, what do we do with this and how do we go about deciding where to discuss it, when to discuss it? Uh, let, let's see. So I can take the, the first stab that based off the uh, last time I think that we received a request at the uh, a council meeting like this, then the next step would be to actually uh, put it on the agenda for the council to discuss whether or not they would like to agendize it for a future meeting. So it'd be, it's a multi-step process. So we, we can follow that if that's, um, um, as long as there's, uh, say one other count, council member um, uh, wanting to do that in addition to Vice Mayor Taylor, then, then it would be uh, scheduled for an upcoming um, council agenda um, for a future discussion. And just to clarify, so the resources expended at this point would not be the development of a staff report ahead. It'd be a little baby staff report baby, baby. that just lists the four options we exactly. have at that meeting. Yes. Okay. I, I'm comfortable with that. And I'm seeing a nod from council member door and from council member Nash. Okay. Mayor Vice Wilson. Taylor. Yes. Thank you. If, uh, my, my only other um, request is that if we could put a time stamp on it, like make this a, a 15 minute discussion. I don't want this to, I know that our meetings are, are pretty um, full. So I just wanted to make sure that we talk about it. We, we put a time stamp on it. It's a 15 minute or less discussion. And I just say that just to respect people's time. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. I'll follow up with the city manager on, but I, but I believe the conversation would be limited to whether or not we're actually going to dedicate staff resources and time to it. So I think by design, it's a limited conversation, but thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. Um, uh, so Council Member Nash. So I have two report outs. Um, one is uh, last week, Peninsula Clean Energy Board of Directors met in person for the first time since March 2020, which was very exciting. And um, in that meeting, we learned that um, PCE, Peninsula Clean Energy, broke 100 ap appliance incentive application, rebate applications in a month, which is the first time it's done so. And um, just so people know, there's been a number of changes that have been made to the program. Um, it was previously for just for uh, heat pump water heaters, and now there's increased incentives. They've added heat pump HVAC systems. We've added 0% loans and the option to receive rebates without going through the regional Bay Ren program, which had been something that people had been asking for. And so there's been a very rapid uptake in the program and multiple contractors are signing up each week. So hopefully that means we will have more people um, available to put in uh, electric appliances um, for those people who are choosing to do that. And about two thirds of the applications are for the HVAC systems and the balance are for the heat pump water heaters. And about 10% of those applications actually include a panel upgrade, which is also something that you can get an um, additional rebate for. And then the second um, item that I wanted to report out on was from today. Um, I attended the Haywired scenario, um, which are exercises that explore impacts of a magnitude 7.0 earthquake on the Hayward Fault centered near Oakland and its af aftershocks. And it emphasizes the variety of physical, technological, and societal impacts associated with the multiple hazards and cascading impacts of such an event. And there were a number of city staff present. In addition, um, Public Works had Joanna Chen, um, Whitlow, Whit Loy attended from IT, the GIS, um, from Library Community Services was Ashley Walker. And um, the police department had two people, um, Chief 
Norris was there as, as well as Sergeant Scott Mac McAdams. So we had a really good showing there and it was very worthwhile, um, three and a half hours. So thank you. Thank you for attending that, uh, Council Member Nash. Um, so my updates are um, at the same time as the local policymaker group for Caltrain last week, there was a quiet zone community meeting um, at Ariaga that was very well attended. For those community members who are interested in finding out what's going on with the quiet zone, there is now information posted to the city's website that contains the presentation and a video from that meeting and a lot of good information. Um, and so I look forward to that coming to council. Um, as kind of wearing my mayor hat, um, the I had a meeting with our new Chamber of Commerce, the San Mateo County Chamber of Commerce. Amy Buckmaster is the director there. Um, they have a lot of, you know, great energy, and I'm looking forward to seeing what the new chamber brings. Um, I'm actually meeting with uh, City Manager Murphy and a downtown business uh, stakeholder tomorrow with the new chamber. Um, so they're, they're starting to engage in our community. Um, also as mayor this week, it was kind of like a blood sweat and, or last week I had both blood and sweat given. Um, I planted a tree. I don't think I sweat that much. It was really just two shovelfuls and I gave blood to the Stanford blood center. And I want to encourage, <laughs> it's totally this little blood and sweat. I don't think I cried for the city last week, but I, I might've. Um, but regarding the blood, I want to encourage all residents that there still indeed is a blood shortage. Um, the, the blood that our community members give is vital to um, Stanford and the Children's Hospital, and they also supply um, other hospitals. So it was really painless, very easy, um, got lots of cookies. They were so nice there. So if you're, you don't need to go to a spa or whatever, go to the Stanford Blood Center, you get to sit in a fabulous chair and be treated really well. So please do that. Um, and later next week, um, the city manager and vice mayor Taylor and I are gonna be meeting at the tri-mayor meeting. <laughs> Uh, I also had tri mayor tournament um, with East Palo Alto and Palo Alto. Um, so that'll be um, an ongoing group that's going to meet to discuss our common concerns and topics. So um, lots going on. Thank you, Council, for your updates. Um, and I think with that, at 10.04, we will adjourn tonight's meeting. Thank you.